Yes, good morning, listeners and viewers. My name is Asimwe Anat Bazindwa, the moderator of today's webinar. Under the title, How Should Universities Strategize Themselves in the Fourth Industrial Revolution? Uh, briefly, I want to take us through the program of the day's activity. We shall begin with a prayer led by the Right Reverend Dr. Fred Sheldon Mesqua. And we shall briefly introduce panelists. We shall have the opening remarks from the VC, who is the host, the Vice Chancellor Bishop Stewart University, Professor Mauda Kamatenis Mujisha. And we shall have a keynote address by the Right Reverend Dr. Sheldon Mesqua. And we shall have the general overview of the Bishop Stewart University strategic plan by Dr. Mugabe Robert. And we shall have our panelists beginning with Dr. Kedres to the agenda. We'll talk about how universities should strategize themselves and force industrial revolution in the education sector. And we shall have Dr. Patrick Bitature who will enlighten the public how universities should strategize themselves in the fourth industrial revolution and the business sector. We shall also have the regulator who is Dr. Nora Murira, who is going to enlighten the viewers in today's webinar, how should universities strategize themselves in the fourth industrial revolution. We shall have Mr. Stephen Langa, who will tell us how the religion sector is prepared on how universities should strategize themselves in the fourth industrial revolution. And we shall have an open discussion where we shall be throwing in poll questions and the panelists shall be able to be given a little time and clarify on them. And we shall be sharing the results from the poll questions. And we shall end with a closing prayer and benediction by the Right Reverend Dr. Fred Sheldon Mwesje. You are most welcome in this session of how should universities strategize themselves in the fourth industrial revolution. We are waiting for the Vice Chancellor to log in. Otherwise, we are adequately prepared as we wait for the opening prayer. Shortly, the Vice Chancellor is logging in and we shall begin. You are most welcome and may the Lord bless all of us. As, as we shared the program, we are now on the first item of opening prayer. I hereby request our own, the Right Reverend Dr. Fred Sheldon Mwesigwa to take us in the opening prayer. You are most welcome. Thank you. Let us pray. Our dear loving Lord, we want to thank you so much for this new morning and for your mercies that are new every other day. And despite the challenging season in which we are, the new times and the new technologies and the new methodologies, we pray that you continue to bless us so that yes. our aim will be achieved. Bless everybody who will be speaking Everybody will be participating, our machines. We pray that everything will work out for the glory of your name, especially as we understand the times in which we live in an academic environment, but at the same time being able to know, guide us in this new season, new challenging times. Let everything work out for the glory of your name. We thank you, we praise you, we honor you. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, my Lord Bishop. The second item on the program is the introduction of the panelists. Let me take this honor to introduce the panelists of, of today's webinar, a titled, How Should Universities Strategize Themselves in the Fourth Industrial Revolution? We have the right reverend, Dr. Fred, Sheldon Mwesigwa, who will be our keynote address speaker in today's webinar. We shall have our 
Vice Chancellor Professor Mauda Kamatenes Mujisha, who shall give us the opening remarks, who is the host. We shall have Dr. Robert Mugabe, who will give the general overview of the Bishop Stewart University strategic plan, and followed by Dr. Kedres to the agenda, who will tell the public how should universities strategize themselves under the forced industrial revolution on education sector. And we shall have Dr. Nora Murida, who is representing the Regulator National Council for Higher Education. And finally, we shall have Mr. Stephen Langa, who will educate the public in today's webinar, how should universities strategize themselves in the fourth industrial revolution and the religious sector. Now let me take this humble opportunity to invite the Vice Chancellor with the host, Professor Mauda Kamatenes Mujisha, to give her opening remarks. Professor Mauda, you are most welcome. Thank you very much, Madam University Secretary, to the members who are listening to me, to our panelists. I begin by saluting you all. As Bishop Stuart University, we are indeed honored by your presence. Our Chancellor, Right Reverend Dr. Fred Sheldon Mwesigwa, our Professor Mary of Akor, our panelists represented here by Dr. Nora Murira, specialist in IT, Dr. Kedros Tugajenda, Director, Education Studies Agency, Minister of Education and Sports in Uganda, Dr. Patrick Ibitature, the CEO and Chairman of Simba Group of Companies in East Africa, Mr. Stephen Langa, ED Family Network, Dr. Robert Mugabe, our very own an economist, BSU staff from the Faculty of Business, Economics and Governance. To all our invited guests, Vice Chancellors and their representatives, the alumni, academicians, local government officials, businessmen, NGOs, students, ladies and gentlemen. I greet you all in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and I say, praise God. And indeed, today, we are honored hosting the first webinar as Bishop Seth University. So on my own behalf, and on behalf of BSU, I warmly welcome you to this webinar, and appreciate you for honoring our invitation. And our panelists, we are forever grateful and to all the members who are here and Bishop Stuart University fraternity, wherever you are, we want to say we love you, we thank you, and we honor you. May the good Lord bless you. Bishop Stuart University is a chartered university that was founded in 2002, chartered in 2014, and it belongs to Anglican yeah, Anglican province of the Church of Uganda started by a basis. And our student population, we now stand at 5,000. We run almost about 100 programs, 30 certificates, 50 diplomas, 8 postgraduate diplomas, 12 masters, 4 PhD programs, and two certificates, including higher education certificate. As a university, we are really moving on well with a total population of staff that is over 360. And I can say, before the lockdown, that was a staff, but now the status could be different, as you all know. Uh, so, before the closure, we had started on working on our strategic plan, 2021-2030. We had already discussed it at council, the council members who are here in the know. We had engaged the key stakeholders. But when COVID-13, we had to replan, refocus, 
and do further community and stakeholder engagements and consultations. And therefore, this is one of the very reasons we are here to strategize. As my role is definitely to welcome all of you and to say briefly about BSU, I want to say that we are moving on, no matter the lockdown, no matter the challenges. As a university, you say we have to really think on how to develop new programs, redesigning our own, our old programs, even right now, every program must have online teaching. We are also uh, working on issues to do with students' access to the services at Bishop State University, particularly having online uh, teaching, doing online exams, we have set up infrastructure. And I can say National Council has been able to visit us. Uh, we are waiting for uh, a letter from them to give us a direction, but we hope we have already put in the infrastructure that is needed to start online teaching. We have zero rating from MTN. We have a renew network system. And at the same time, our staff have been trained to do or their policies have been put in place by council uh, to run online programs and senate. And also, we have collaborations that are going to enable us to reach there, to plan, to strategize as a university. We have several, several MOUs uh, with universities around, Makere University, for example, Bara University of Science and Technology, with Uganda Christian University. We have an MOU with the University of Dar es Salaam. And we have an MOU that is current with the Trinity Western University in Canada, where right now we have already put up infrastructure of the first center. And we have so far been visited by National Council for Education. The MOU was already drafted. It was verification and we hope it will go on. And once it goes on, we are going to be running programs together with Trinity Western Canada. And that is a very big achievement for us as a BSU. We share the same ethos as we've had It's another Christian university in partnership with BSU. We take our students to Israel. We have a partnership with Agro Studies. We take our students to Israel for internship. And so far, since 2014, our students uh, who do agriculture and agribusiness, animal health, are selling like hot cake. So that is another partnership that we, we are really cherishing as an institution. We are also uh, having collaborations with the local leaders or the local organizations like NARO, although it is part of international, but there is Marara, Zono, Offices, Bazadri, we are in touch. We are in collaboration with the, with the Mbarara Farmers Associations. And we are also working very well with the community to ensure our programs are compliant. And so your presence here today and your participation is very key. Therefore, BSU being a Christian university, I want to draw your attention to this word. God is in charge. And therefore, in the words of Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 to 9, I quote, this is my command, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or disguised, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Therefore, we are truly believing God that even if you go there in the new norm of COVID pandemic, we shall reach there. Once again, I thank you very much for listening to me and for your fruitful deliberations, which we're expecting from you. Our good reigns. Thank you so much, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Mauda. Straight, let's go back to the program. For the program, we have the keynote address, and it is going to be done by none other than Right Reverend Dr. Fred Sheldon Mwesigwa. He's the Bishop of Ankara Diocese, the Chancellor of Bishop Stewart University, the Chairperson, Board of Trustee, Bishop Stewart University. Dr. Fred holds 
a PhD and a Master of Education from the University of Reeves. He is a renowned researcher and publisher. Therefore, I take this humble opportunity to invite my Lord Bishop to give the keynote address to the viewers and listeners of today's webinar. You are most welcome. Thank you very much, Madam Bazindwa. And thank you, Vice Chancellor, for that good introduction. Um, presenting on how should universities strategize themselves in the fourth industrial revolution. And my presentation is categorized under greetings and introduction, uh, introduction to the topic and concept of university. Three is the sequencing of industrial revolutions. Four, the purpose of universities. Five, strategies for universities in the fourth industrial revolution and uh, the challenges and conclusions. Uh, on the greetings and the introduction, I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and special appreciation to all those who are participating and particularly the chief presenters whom we shall be listening to, very busy people who have set aside time. BSU is a Christian university that was established following a minute of the Synod of Ancore Diocese. And therefore, that's why, as the Vice Chancellor said, this is a university founded by the Church of Uganda, Ancore Diocese, and it's under also the province of Church of Uganda. Uh, BSU aims at providing higher education in a Christian environment. And that is very, very key in a Christian environment. And therefore, we aim at promoting values education as enshrined in the motto, in the vision, and the core values of the university. And according to the Uganda National Council for Higher Education, we currently have 52 universities in Uganda, nine of which are public and 43 are private. BSU is among the private universities and though it has been in existence for years, it has made some strides in academic pursuit, research, and innovation. In December 2019, BSU emerged the best university out of 131 universities in Africa at Cape Coast Ghana, at the Regional Universities Forum for Capacity Building in Agriculture, which we call Reforum. That was not a mean feat. According to the most recent international webometric ranking of universities, BSU was ranked fourth best private university in Uganda and the 10th best university, including public universities. So for a young, growing university, I think that is commendable. Let me go on to the introduction to the topic and the context of university. The word university is a word that derives from university and universalism, but it mainly refers to a college of teachers and researchers, a college of teachers and researchers or scholars. So there is learning and teaching, but there is also scholarly work, which is by specialists who delve into their particular professions and create knowledge and impact society. Modern universities are an offshoot of the very first universities, which is traced in Africa. The first university in the world was in Africa. As Zituna, actually it was Islamic in Tunis, Tunisia, founded in 737. And while the oldest university in Europe is Bologna in Italy, 1088. All ancient and medieval universities, including Cambridge, 1206, Oxford, 1636, Harvard 1636 were founded by religious institutions. And that is the key to know the religious grounding of universities. The first universities to be founded in the world were grounded on values issues. However, almost all major, major universities now have veered off into lib liberal secular ideology, which is very sad. 
Let's look at the sequencing of the Industrial Revolution. The first Industrial Revolution from 1760 to around 1840 saw transition to new manufacturing processes, which was a shift from hand production to machine, the water and steam engine and all that. The second Industrial Revolution is dated between 1870 to 1914, it ends to 20th century. This is referred to as the age of scientific discovery or the technological revolution. There was an advancement in manufacturing and production technology, mainly using electric power. That was the time of electric power. The third industrial revolution can be dated around the 1950s, which brought forth the rise of electronics, telecommunications, and the computer world, including the internet as we have it. Oh, very sorry. Yeah, we are now getting you clear in my road, Bishop. Hello? Oh, very yes. sorry. Electricity went off and moved to another mode of communication. Very sorry. Okay. I was on the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution is considered to be the age of artificial intelligence. That is scientific knowledge imitating human processes through the fusion of physical, digital, and biological world. The interconnectedness of all these processes is referred to as the Internet of Things. So the stage at which we are is the one of artificial intelligence, where human beings, their brains are being replaced by machines, the digital world, and some machines can even act like human beings. There is an interdisciplinary approach in this era of, uh, of in the fourth industrial revolution, whereby research has collaboration between the scientists and the humanities and all other fields. So it's no longer research based in only one field. Then something to do with the purpose of university. I believe the purpose of universities should be intellectual stimulation we know high school as being advanced level. So you can imagine when you move from ordinary level, advanced level, then to, 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 to university, there must be an uptake in the, time, in the kind of intellectual stimulation a student gets. So we should see that happen. Research should be a core aspect of university. Values, as I mentioned earlier, the founding of universities was on values. That is key, especially for Christian universities, but even public universities. The innovation and skills igniting. Any university that may not lead to innovation and skills development would not be worth the name of university. And last, community engagement. A university should not live in isolation of the community in which it lives. It must engage. So strategies of universities in the post revolution. One, Christian values and work ethics should be an integral part of the success of post industrial revolution. I know we live at a time where people are only concerned about the digital world, the artificial intelligence, the internet of things, but all these, if they are not grounded in ethics and values, we shall have a problem. And I think that's why we are having a problem of the COVID-19 pandemic, because when you look at the source of the problem, the major indicator seems to be that it is a man-made problem by people who might have misused the virus. B, deliberate steps need to be taken to prioritize ICTs in budgeting for universities, because if we spend on many other things and not ICTs, we shall be left out of the fourth industrial revolution. C, there is a need for students at the bottom line. This is, uh, is challenging, but this is the reality. To be encouraged and struggle, expected to have not only mobile phones, but laptops. Without this, it will be very difficult. We shall be left back. D, Uganda's youthful population. We are, we are told the third fastest growing population in Africa. 
in Uganda is an asset that can easily adjust to ICTs and a good number are highly creative and innovative. We should not underrate Africans. Our young people are innovative and creative. It's just that they've not been given the opportunity. And we have many young people, which is an advantage. Western countries are crying out for population. They are bringing policies which encourage people to give back, and people are not willing. So let's use that as an opportunity. E, the curriculum for universities needs to be reviewed, especially post-COVID-19, to address the changing market need, including what we are seeing now as take-home jobs instead of office jobs, and many other areas where we need to think as a result of the COVID. Then there is a need also for the 21st century, new skills set. We need a new skill set for the economy and enterprises that are mainly IT and social media driven. A lot of activity takes place on social media, by the way, apparently. And if you are in high school, higher education, and you are not connected, and you're a lecturer, and you are not on WhatsApp, you are not on this social media, then there is a problem. By 2050, it is projected that 97.5% of the world will be connected to the internet. So there is a lot that can be transacted using the internet. Universities being agents of transformation of society dictates that they engage with the community to assess the problems and the challenges and meet the needs of the community, whether it is environment, whether it is trade, whatever, whatever field, or whatever academic program should be linked with the community there. Challenges of universities strategizing for the fourth industrial revolution as I almost come to the end. The cost of quality fourth industrial revolution compliant university education is very high and not many can afford it. I'm talking about quality of fourth industrial revolution compliant university. We need to ask ourselves, I, our universities compliant to the fourth industrial revolution needs, the cost is high, prohibitive. Most of the universities, especially in Uganda, have been accused of providing low quality education. And part of the problem is inferior to prioritize spending on ICTs. And if we don't have this, then there is a big challenge. Continue. Many universities are localized. You know, we have many universities, but they are local. And they are not making an attempt to be national, let alone uh, international. And not attempting to establish partnerships with other local universities, even before you go outside. Connect with other universities and international universities, of course. I'm, I'm proud and lucky and blessed to see that BSU continues to have collaboration with international universities. And one of the, 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 the universities we are trying to work with, we are trying to see how to, to, to emphasize the use of herbal medicine as opposed to Western medicine. That project is coming. They are going to support uh, Haro Mission Hospital and there are researchers who are trying to collaborate with us. Universities need to connect with organizations, research agencies, distinct scholars, and that type. That is only when we shall be compliant to the fourth industrial revolution expectation. D, the failure of exposure of university students to ICTs during primary and secondary school learning phases becomes an impediment or a challenge. So how I pray that the Minister of Education look toward upscaling also in the primary so that students don't just meet the ICTs at university. Conclusion. Universities can strategize for the fourth industrial revolution by being concerned with morals and ethics, even public universities. Short of this, all the success stories will come to nothing. Those who follow politics in the USA, I don't know how many of you are following what is happening in the USA because of the promotion of secular liberal ideologies. That country is almost dead as a country. 
but because the emphasis is may be on the technology and not the morals. B, there is a need for universities to prioritize spending on ICTs and equip students with new skill sets to meet emerging community and market needs. Self-explanatory. Uh, third, African universities cannot afford to be left behind in this era of ICTs and artificial intelligence. It is a matter of survival. Anyway, say it in D. Governments need to commit resources in funding fourth industrial revolution requisite technology if our very survival is not to be compromised. And I've prepared a very short video. I don't know whether the moderators have it. It is about uh, pacemakers. My mother is making 90 years this year. And my mother has a pacemaker inserted into her. It has been changed three times. And when you look at this pacemaker, there is a friend of mine who might be linked into this presentation. He's doing a PhD, I think, in some electronics in Edinburgh. I was conversing with him and told him about the situation of my mother. My mother's pacemaker now is, 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 is outdated, but this gentleman is working on a, a very modern pacemaker. But my mother's heart now has, is being helped um, by a machine which is placed in her, uh, which is connected to her heart. So watch and see what we mean by uh, artificial intelligence and this high tech world which we should desire to go to which we are not yet there in. so can you play that as the last bit do you see on about two minutes There's no volume. You can play it later, maybe. Bishop, I am requesting you keep a bit patient. We are going to send questions in relation to what you have presented. But otherwise, thank you so much for, for opening the antennas of viewers and listeners in today's webinar on how universities should strategize themselves in the fourth industrial revolution. Thank you so much, thank you, thank you. I was communicating to the viewers and listeners on Facebook and Twitter that use the following hashtag to throw your questions and they shall be answered. BSU webinar, fourth industrial revolution. And those on Zoom, you send your questions using two and eight tab. You are most welcome. As we prepare for the poll question, I request the following speaker to be ready. Dr. Robert Mugabe, who is going to take us through the general overview of Bishop Stewart University strategic plan. Who is Dr. Robert Mugabe? Dr. Robert is a consultant in economics, public policy, and planning. He holds a PhD from Pretoria University. Dr. Robert Mugabe, you are most welcome. Thank you so much. And um, let me share my presentation. As Dr. Robert Mugabe is sharing his presentation, I request my Lord Bishop to keep reviewing questions in two and A put to him, and you answer them electronically. Thank you. Thank you so much, moderator. My Lord Bishop, the Chancellor, Bishop Stuart University, um, uh, Dr. Shouder Miesugwa, uh, Vice Chancellor, Bishop Stuart University, Mauda Kamatenes, then my US, who is our moderator, and then panelists, my panelists, and then ladies and gentlemen. 
allow me to make this overview presentation of Bishop Stuart University strategic plan. This strategic plan I'm going to present is in a draft form because we are still gathering the views. And I can now see and guarantee members and viewers that from this uh, presentation of today, this conference of today, we are gathering very rich views, very rich information of which we are going to incorporate in ensuring that Bishop Stuart University comes up with one of the best strategic plan that we can have to guide our institution. So, as you definitely know, that a strategic plan is a very important management tool that normally determines the direction of the university. Bishop Stuart University has been operating on a strategic plan, which definitely uh, started in 20, uh, 20, uh, 2012 to 2019, I mean to 2020, and that this strategic plan, we are talking about before we come to the new strategic plan, we want to bring in the new landmark, the landmark of this new strategic plan. So the university has been implementing strategic plan 2012, 2020, or 2021 that had aimed at repositioning the university into a nationally, international acknowledged provider of quality training and research guided by the Christian values. This has been achieved through complying with the National Council for Education requirements in a program of design and training in supporting the government, private, non-governmental sector to deal with the development and management challenges. The university set out to produce graduates that are knowledgeable, analytical, and who are able to apply creative, innovative, practical, effective solutions to current and future business managerial, legal, medical and leadership challenges. The strategic plan 2012-2020 was anchored on eight critical and related pillars, namely research and innovations, teaching and learning, human resource development, infrastructure development, social responsibility, linkages and networks with development partners. Then based on financial resource base for the university and the support function of the university. That means the strategic plan 2012-2019 strategic plan marked the period of expansion and growth provided and a strong foundation for university to continuously be recognized as among the higher ranked universities in Uganda according to the latest ranking. Then we talk about the landmarks and achievements per peer. When we talk about research and innovation, what has so far been achieved? What has so far been achieved? is that research and innovation policy has, was developed and generated and elevated the school, uh, the graduate school in 2012-2013 to directorate of graduate research and innovation. The university put in the place a graduate handbook that guides training and, and, and degrees, a competitive staff research fund and was introduced in 2011 and raised from 50 uh, million to 100 million per academic year in 2015. Training workshops on writing grant proposals have been conducted and uh, graduate recruit and uh, um, this, this which is, um, so training workshop have been and then a, a grant officer recruited in 2011, I mean in 2014. There was setting up of public and publication committee to manage the students and lectures publications. Then on teaching and learning, we are saying that the, the content and the methodology lectures, uh, lectures follow current holistic trends and teaching. BSU has good lecture space ratio, a student ratio of 1.14 square meters with ample lighting, uh, furniture, resources. BSU has a clear mission, a, a clear admission criteria as articulated in the general academic policy. BSU has a clear student's recruitment selection policy. Then clearly articulated student assessment policies, grading system, and then clearly articulated student assessment policies and grading system criteria. Then there is a council committee or appointment and staff warfare that that recruits staff promotions, contract renewals, and makes a recommendation to human resource related policy to council. Staff development policy is a place that has greatly contributed to the career development at different levels. 
Availability and efficiency of staff appraisal systems in place. Recruitment is done in reference to human resource manual. Promotion is done in reference to human resource manual. Then on human resource development, there is um, um, this. Then we talk about on infrastructure. Then we talk about BSU has adequate land. BSU has acquired additional land for expanding university activities. Adequate and pro appropriate teaching and learning facilities include lecture rooms, laboratory and workshop, library and computer rooms are in place. Adequate and appropriate administration facilities including central administration, departmental areas, staff common rooms and offices are in place. Adequate and appropriate teaching uh, equipment and materials. There is usable sports complex under construction. Then on social responsibility, Bishop Stuart University has given back to community through free health sanitation training in the cleanups and the cleanups. The university has put up an effort on road safety through publishing of zebra crossing marks on the several roads in the towns of Western Uganda. The university has, has encouraged dialogue and conflict settlement through provision of legal aid clinics for legal services through its faculty of law. The university has proposed purpose as purpose to support church projects uh, with grieved and needed, uh, needed families. The university has supported the needed students under the work and study scheme. And this one has definitely helped very many to access the education. Then on linkages and networks with development, as presenters have been saying, there are very many memorandums and collaborations BSU has already entered. There are many here, here what I'm highlighting, uh, very few of them. The Trinity University, Western University in the Canada for Student Exchange Program and the Curriculum Development, Netherlands, Farm Ex uh, Experts Group for Capacity Building. Then we talk about Roforum, that means building in agricultural science, avid skilling the use. Then we have got an ag agribusiness incubation and innovation hub has been uh, put in place with collaborations. Then we talk about narrow funded ethos. So botco botany projects won by university with a grant of one and four million activities. This is uh, activities that are commenced in 2016. Is normally uh, the principal investigator here is our vice chancellor, the, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Mauro Kamatenis. Then we talk about the skilling use under the project where greenhouse shed had been structures and constructed university from students. Then. We we'll talk about the linkages. We are still talking about the narrows and the other youth linkages. Then we are talking about boosting the finance. Efficient financial management system is in place. The institution has functional financial operating system which is integrated with the banks. This financial system is integrated with academic information uh, management system. And then we university received 150, 150 uh, million, uh, 150 million out of this, out of one billion shillings presidential pledge for science and, uh, I mean, a bit of, yes, the university received 150 million out of one billion shilling presidential pledge for enhancing science and engineering teaching and learning at the university through construction of science laboratory and complex. University procurement units in the place and follows the university procurement guidelines and its work. The university financial accounts are annually audited by external auditors. This practice not only promotes accountability, but also improves the efficiency of the finance department. Then we talk about support services. We have what we call the university has availability of well articulated vision, the mission and objectives of library in line with the institution objectives, awareness of ICT developments, preservation and digitalization of information resources and the growth of institution while establishing the strategic direction of the library, availability of adequate policies for the library, including collection development, ICT and information uh, literacy policies, sufficient user license for electron electronic resources and appropriate utilization of consortium purchasing and licensing agreements, adequacy of intellectual and physical accessibility to the library. Then boosting the financial resource base. We have efficient financial management system in place, efficiency in the, uh, this, um, the linkage and networks, this one I've already, uh, we have already uh, seen them here. Then 
We are talking about the availability of virus related division. This one I've already been uh, mentioned here. Then we talk about of all this, what has been the success factors for this strategic plan 2012-2020? The success factors that the University achieved all of this was the university history, that means for the founding body and the PTC's goodwill, committed and supporting governing university council, committed and dedicated university top management, then progressive infrastructure development, competent and committed staff, supportive government program that's higher education policy, then we talk about strategic location of the university campus, then competitive programs that meet the labor market, linkages and partnerships with external stakeholders, institutions and universities. However, the university has been meeting the challenges in implementing the strategic plan 2012-2020. And what are these challenges? Limited funding to meet financial requirements of the university due to heavy dependence on the fees. Variations in the projected student numbers, inability to achieve the annual budget due to inappropriate fees charges. Then we have students dropout rate defaulting on fees and value at risk. The high cost of borrowing and exchange rate fluctuations, quality assurance challenges, inadequate office space for staff, limited PhD staff, inflation and heavy taxation. Then what is the rationale for the new strategic plan? This new strategic plan according to our internal uh, consultation and stakeholder meetings. We had anchored it on a five-year strategic plan, but there are some proposals that we should make it a 10-year strategic plan. And by the time we complete this uh, meeting, uh, this, uh, this uh, forum, many members would have suggested, should we make it a five-year strategic plan or make it a 10-year strategic plan? But this presentation is now based on a five-year strategic plan, but subject to the views of the stakeholders. So Bishop Stewart University has achieved a lot in the strategic plan period of 2012-2020, while the previous strategic plan focused on expansion and growth the new strategic plan seeks to build on and consolidate the previous achievements and guarantee quality of services and products. The university has, however, faced a number of challenges that have constrained the achievement of the desired targets. The new strategic plan 2021-2025, therefore, will take these factors into consideration and put in place a mechanism to mitigate the challenges. Strategic planning process. This strategic plan is normally done through participatory approach where both the internal and external stakeholders are put on board. Therefore, the university applied the participatory planning strategy that started with putting in place the strategic planning technical committee that started gathering views from internal stakeholders that include heads of department, dean directors, senior management team, top management team. The team started the journey of developing strategic plan 2021-2025 with a reviewing of running strategic plan 2012-2020 to register successes and challenges that will be a basis on developing the new strategic plan. To ensure broad participation in the planning process, there is a need to gather the views from external stakeholders and thereafter there will be a need to build a consensus on issues emanating from the internal and stakeholder consultations, which will determine the strategic direction of the next five years. Yes, we have the strategic analysis and we're talking about environmental scan because an environment, any institution operates in both internal environment and external environment. Under internal environment, we have the strength, then what are the strengths? Charter University by the government of Uganda, BSU runs accredited programs, relatively well structured program, good name and strong brand of Bishop Stuart since college days, Christian identity and heritage of BSU are the church founding institution, location of BSU in Mbarama municipality, strong governance, that's the council and its committees, strong management team with trust and high levels of integrity. But also it has enjoyed some opportunities, relative strategic location in the municipality, many good sources, that schools for student recruitment in the hinterland, young, good and energetic team of staff, academic and administrative to be groomed and tooled, government, government goodwill, existence of alumni association, collaborative partnership, universities consortium, memorandum of understanding, it is supportive communities and local leadership. However, it has some internal weaknesses, no clear strategy on resource mobilization, not much external funds to, appreci to appreci appreciable amounts raised externally. 
overrunning on tuition as a source of funding, insufficient infrastructure for lecture rooms and offices, limited staff exposure, and some inexperienced staff in some sections are recruited, lack of clear marketing and communication strategy, limited partnership and networking, lack of clear marketing and communication strategy, poor performance appraisal and poor reporting structure and system. Poor performance appraisal poor, and poor reporting structures and systems. On threats, there is competition from other higher institutions of learning and tertiary institutions, relatively higher tuition and functional charges as compared to uh, our neighbors, general moral decadence, liberalism and globalization, climate change and failure in the people's livelihoods, economic hardships, low salaries and the high cost of living, government policies, then the weak regulations, follow-up of students and tracer studies, national and international politics affecting morals and student organization, resignation and the non-contractual renewals of some senior staff. So what are therefore emerging issues from this? The above analysis highlights the following issues that merit attention over the next five years if the university is to live up to its desired legacy and the free obligation. The university needs to make a complete and comprehensive strategic plan in 2021-25 Senate Committee of Structuring Programs, Courses, Departments, and Faculty need to be enhanced. Then use of work plans and the measure performance of staff with clear targets. Identify key areas and flagships niche for BSU. Then strengthen quality and unit quality assurance. And then develop and implement integrated marketing and communication strategy, develop consulting services, then need for capacity building for universities to have qualified staff. Then we are talking about the BSU determining the strategic direction. Strategic positioning of the next five years, Bishop Stuart University built to educate and nurture national and international graduates who apply their talents and skills to advance global society with multiple sexual leaders, operators to know the way, show the way, and go the way. Our vision, therefore, here is that the vision the vision of BSU, the vision of, BS, of Bishop Stuart University is to be a university for creating the African society with academic excellence, entrepreneurship, and Christian values. The mission is the mission is to produce multi-sector leaders, operators who know the way, show the way, and go the way. The university also has a motto: Our God reigns. We have also incorporated the marketing struggle that will be helping the university to market program that unlocking your potential. Then the university has operational core values. And what are these core values? Facing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, moral integrity, pursuit of knowledge and unity, then restlessness, service to society, academic independence and excellence, compassion, transparency, and accountability. The thrust of Bishop Stuart University, generating holistic knowledge while building servanthood character by guiding society in selected innovative and relevant skills in scientific, social, political, and economic transformation. Then we have the general aims and objectives to search for the generation and preservation of knowledge through teaching and research, to create awareness to all those admitted to the university and make provision for enhanced advancement, stimulation of intellectual life in Uganda and the world over. To offer courses relevant to the needs of all people in the struggle for development in a holistic approach where men and women will develop their full potential academically, spiritually, physically, and thus making them productive in their community. To provide Christian ethics and universal moral values, which will be the basis to personal and interpersonal relationships. Therefore, the strategic pillars for 2021, 2025 strategic plan are based on, 20, um, on 11 of them. Research and innovation and industrialization, teaching and learning, human resource development, infrastructure development, technology and industrialization, finance, sustainability, support service function, internationalization, social responsibility, religion and modernity, then cross-cutting issues. When you look at the old strategic plan, the cross-cutting issues were lacking. So strategies are required to achieve each of these objectives. Here we try to present pillars with each strategic objective and strategic action. How can pillar one be achieved? The research, innovation, and industrialization. To achieve this, we need a strategic objective. The strategic objective is to promote knowledge, 
generation, innovations, and outreach services. Strategic action that will be undertaken by the university generate and implement research agenda, expand research funding opportunities, build the capacity and motivate staff and the students to conduct research and publish. Invest innovative technologies and incubation of innovations and patenting. Establish and strengthen incubation hub program across all disciplines offered at Bishop Stuart University. Host and participate in local and international conferences. Strengthen community outreach program. Establish and strengthen university consultancy unit. Restructure and strengthen the directorate of research and innovations. Improve the scholarly journal, boost academic publications at the university. Pillar number two, teaching and learning. The strategic objective is to develop and deliver market responsive academic programs that foster innovatively and industrialization. Strategic action, develop university niche, expand university enrollment through online distance learning, then introduce new modes of delivery and the, the modes of, of delivery, strengthen e-learning and distance learning modes of delivery, strengthen student and staff mental, mentally, then strengthen students assessment mechanism, strengthen the student uh, internship programs, acquire modern teaching aids and tools, improve pedagogical skills among the teaching staff, introduce industrial-based research projects. Pillar three, human resource development. The strategic objective is to strengthen human resource capacity and what is strategic action, undertake human resource planning and recruit, and recruit competent staff and take staff development training and promotions, implement a regular equitable reward system, develop and implement staff welfare schemes such as medical insurance, establish performance management system, and then extremely human resource management practices. Then pillar number four, how is support by achieving structure development? What is strategic objective to expand and maintain infrastructure and ICT capacity? Strategic action, review and implement a university master uh, development plan, equip the library with appropriate resources, e.g. e-learning, expand and furnish lecture rooms, then establish new and expand existing science and engineering laboratories and workshops, strategically develop existing land, completion of the university sports complex, open up, build and light up university roads and pathways, then scale up and maintain robust up-to-date ICT infrastructure. Pillar number five, technology industrialization to innovate Implement, implemented and apply new existing technology is a strategic objective, strategic action, establishment and promotion of university innovation and technology hub. Establishment of university technology park for vocational and technical skills and commercial production. Furnishing of science laboratories with up-to-date technology tools and equipment. Establishment of university hotel and the tourism project. Establishment of technical consultation unit robot for our cost of internet band, bandwidth and other e-resources. Pillar number six, financial sustainability, then strategic objective to boost sustainable financial resource base for the university. Strategic action, then diversify income sources, endowments, grant proposals, should, and fundraising should be emphasized, establish as adequate controls in resource utilization, introduce hybrid budget management, optimal resource, uh, resource optimization, develop and implement business and investment policy for university, strategically acquire prime land, engage government for financial support. That means in terms of tax relief, student loan schemes and partnership development. Commercialization and the self-sustainability of university projects like the farm and the printing place. Then, Pillar number seven, support service function, the strategic objective to provide supportive student services. Then uh, strategic action is support student leadership and welfare programs, maintain a strong alumni relationship, promote sports and recreation, co-cultural activities, strengthen counseling services, improve health service delivery, strengthen chaplaincy and promote spiritual development, strengthen security, promote hospitality services. Pillar number eight, internationalization to develop uh, strategic partnerships and collaboration is strategic objective. Strategic action, periodical review partnerships and collaboration with policy frameworks, identify and develop potential strategies for the research, training and service, promote international collaboration to increase the mutual benefit and visibility, strengthen the partnerships and the collaboration office, promote student exchange program locally and internationally, streamline international communication. Pillar nine, social responsibility, strategic objective is to be a university that supports uh, 
So uh, towards uh, community development, then here we talk about design and participate in the community level which are uh, changing programs, then host participate in local and international conferences, the strength, uh, the strength, then strengthen the communities, strengthen the university research that is community based, improve community gender based practices, promote government and other institutions. Then we have pillar number 10 on regional and governance, strategic objectives are clearly spelled out here with strategic actions and then cross-casting issues we have, we considered here on gender, HIV, poverty, environmental, and global warming, because those are the global issues now, which any teaching university is supposed to put under consideration. Then we talk about possible sources of funding. We said the university could be funded through tuition fees, university investment projects, grants from development partners, then uh, research grants, then government developmental programs, alumni, and then consultancy. So basically, this is what this presentation entails. It is still in a draft form. And therefore, the contribution of members, stakeholders, will be vital to us in enriching this strategic plan, so that becoming one of the most important arrangements. Because this strategic plan needed to be completed, such that the, the, the schools and department can cascade it, so that can, such that it can guide their operations. Therefore, the contribution of members is highly appreciated. I thank you so much. Hello. Thank you so much, Dr. Mugabe, for elaborating clearly the BSU draft strategic plan. I thank you so much. Public viewers and listeners on Facebook and Twitter, keep throwing your questions using this hashtag, BSU webinar, Force Industrial Revolution and those on Zoom use two and A. Your questions have been answered. Thank you so much. Back to the agenda. We are now going to hear from a panelist, Dr. Kedres to the agenda, who is going to tell us how should universities strategize themselves in the force industrial revolution in education sector. Who is Dr. Kedres? Dr. Kedres to the agenda is the Director of Education Standards in the Ministry of Education and Sports. Prior, he served as a Commissioner for Secondary Schools for Secondary Education Standards in the same ministry. He was a tutor and a lecturer of chemistry at the National Teachers College Cavalry. She's known as a founder of, of the head teacher at Nyansano Girls High School. Dr. Tudia Gender holds a bachelor's, holds a PhD in education management and a master of science from Lancaster University. Dr. Kedres is a known motivational speaker, God-fearing lady, and a celebrated educationist. Dr. Kedres, to the agenda, you are most welcome. Are you sure you must start? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, thank you, Anne, for that um, great introduction. I'd like to thank the university for organizing this uh, webinar, and that's the way to go. If we are talking about the fourth industrial revolution, we have to demonstrate it. So I would like to quickly share with you uh, what I put together. I'm glad the bishop alluded to a number of things, and I think we are just going to uh, quickly share um, what else we can do. As you are all aware, we are living in the 21st century, and the 21st century is governed by science, information, and technology. We are part of the world, we are part of the globe, the global village. So we can no longer uh, stay back. My presentation will be um, guided by the following. I'll quickly share what I understand by industrial revolution. And then the role of university, what do I see to be opportunities and options for universities and higher institutions of learning? What is the implication for the future? Are there any challenges? 
So what are the strategies? And then I'll conclude. Now, understanding industrial revolution, uh, when we talk about the fourth, uh, it means that we actually have had three. And looking back at the modern history, industrial revolution is the process that guided the change from what was the agrarian and crafts economy to now the industrial and machine economy. It's actually the process began in Britain in the 18th century and spread to the rest of the world. So industrial revolutions have over the years then affected the social and the economic environment and status of nations. Those who take them on quickly, move faster and develop. Those who delay, miss out. In the first industrial revolution, which was in the 18th century, up to the beginning of the 19th century, that's when mechanization was introduced. I think that's where we are now as Uganda. Here the president continually saying, let's industrialize, let's go from the whole to some more mechanized way. So for the rest, it happened in the 18th century. Industries then replaced agriculture as the main backbone of society economy. And there was massive extraction of coal because with now industry, they needed huge energies and so coal uh, came in handy. It's the time when steam engines and railways were built. And it's around the time actually when greater enlightenment and practical ways and scientific discoveries were done. It's around this time when Sir Isaac Newton came up with his three laws of motion, which all of us have done in physics. The second industrial revolution uh, started in the 19th century, around 1870, and it brought in massive technological advancements. There was emergency of new source of energy, that is when electricity and gas and oil became very common. It's around then that the Middle East picked up because they had a lot of gas and oil. And it was also around the time when the combustion engines, that these vehicles that we drive, uh, came into play. And there was consequently a lot of demand for steel, a lot of demand for communication. And so that was the time when tele telegrams and telephones were brought into play. And uh, around this time, actually, automobiles and, and uh, airplanes we are also um, uh, manufactured, they were also invented. And there was progressive education from just learning literacy and numeracy to learning holistic education that is social, political, and economical. Uh, teaching young people how can they be useful, how can they have uh, democracy, all that came around the second industrial revolution. Research seems to say that it has, it has been the greatest of the four revolutions so far. The third one started in the 20th century. Most of us were in the 20th century, I think, around 1969. And it brought forth the rise of electronics and telecommunications and computers. So for some of us now in Uganda, we are seeing computers in the 21st century, but they actually started in the 20th century. It opened the door for space expeditions and research and biotechnology. I'm sure Professor Kamateka is happy because it's in this uh, last revolution that biotechnology came and I know that her training and her expertise takes her there. So the high level of automation and robotics and all these new things we are looking at now started in the third industrial revolution and a lot of programmable uh, controllers, logic controllers came into place, which are uh, together with the computers we now use, and we now find them already done, but they started in the third. Now that ushered then us into what we are in now, the fourth industrial revolution. And it started really at the dawn of the third millennium, at the beginning of this century. And it develops, it develops virtual reality worlds. It is a revolution that is run and governed by internet and its use. And in this revolution, the urge is you have to think creatively 
about what you do. Yes, the first revolution brought in industries and manufacturing, but now the fourth revolution is saying, can we think creatively on how these processes can be done, how the value chains can be improved, how the distribution chains can be done? Uh, recent, when we were all locked down as uh, the whole globe, uh, people have now can do shopping online, people can do anything, and all these are part and parcel of the fourth industrial revolution in which we are part participants. Now, generally, universities have their cardinal uh, responsibilities and functions, and I've only highlighted four. The first one is that they provide facilities and encourage study and research. Universities are always talking about um, generation of new knowledge. Universities also are meant to advance, uh, to, to encourage advancement and development of knowledge and its application, its application to governments, its application to industry, to commerce, to communities, to health. This is what universities are there for to help their students build a good knowledge system and help students be quick learners and problem solvers instead of just teaching them to learn things and try to reproduce them because they are training people who are going out to do real work. And fourthly, universities assure the relevance of their knowledge, identifying skills, creating special programs, building the right skills that can be helpful in their own home country, but also across the world, especially now that we are part of the global village. So basically, universities across the world do this. Now, what do we see then in our current university education? The model we seem to have in our education now is really based on the first industrial revolution rather than the fourth. And that to me is a very sad thing. Our education as universities is characterized by high dependence of, of students on their learning and research. There is minimal use of the massive open online courses which are available with us. Very few people even know that they exist. There is inadequate use of internet for teaching learning process. And this one we have experienced in the lockdown when the ministry said, okay, universities, now you can use e-learning. It's about two months now, and a few have actually qualified. So there is that inadequate use of internet in our universities, which shouldn't happen. And then we have the stereotype systems of knowledge acquisition and research, which is kind of close to what was in the assembly line in the first revolution where one person does a small part, passes it on to the next one, and it goes through the chain and you get the product later. We, we don't seem to yet be where we are supposed to be in this uh, fourth industrial revolution. So what are the skills needed then in this fourth industrial revolution for us to be competitive globally? Um, as someone has written, I've not quoted him, he says, we are training learners or students for jobs that do not yet exist. I mean, we can no longer now look at engineering for what it was and agriculture for what it was. These young people are going into an unknown world. So universities should give them flexible skills, which will help them not only to cope, but to blossom. And these skills include communication skills. Our learners should learn to communicate, both verbally, in writing, and all kinds of communication. Digital literacy is now something I must do. I remember uh, when President Clinton was still president of the United States, on one of his addresses, he made a statement that has been stuck on my mind. He said, if you are computer illiterate, then you are illiterate anyway. So the fourth industrial revolution requires that all young people acquire digital literacy. They learn to cooperate. They learn to be independent learners, to search for knowledge, to do research. They learn to be innovative and creative. They learn to think critically. And they also learn financial literacy. Because if we don't 
have financial literacy, then in worrowing in poverty, and that cannot make us competitive. So these are some of what they call the 21st century skills, which we need. Now, this century where we are, we need to see a transformation socially. While the 20th century, we had transport and cars and planes and energy and materials and all these things, policies and, and public, um, public systems, now in the 20th first century, we are more into communication. We are looking at computers and networks, not only technical networks, but social networks. As the, as the bishop was saying, there are all these social media and we are able to get in touch with each other. We are able to discuss issues. We are able to educate each other. Knowledge bits, partnerships, and I'm glad it was mentioned in our strategic plan and even the VC mentioned it in her briefs. Partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. We in Africa, we know that if you are really to get a very good product, you need more than yourself. Global citizenry, I wish I had time to talk about this. These learners we have in our universities are not just for Uganda or East Africa, they are for the world. So they need those skills. What do I need to do? Which many, how many languages do I need to learn? What skills do I need to be able to survive? And then the markets which are available, they are not no longer the old markets that we had. They have to learn to discover the markets that will feed them today and tomorrow. So education for tomorrow citizens then um, would be an education system which prepares students for a world driven by this, I will say disruptive, this disruptive scientific and technological advancement. As you know, there are so many new things happening. Before you learn one thing, another one is coming. So these students we have, these young people, have to be on their toes for knowledge and be able to adapt and adopt so that they are able to compete and continue. As you are aware, uh, some time ago when computers had just started, we used to use the floppy disks to store material. Then we went on to the flash. Now we have moved on from then. Maybe even what we have tomorrow will not be working. So there is that continuous dynamic life of, of IT and our learners need to have their minds set to that kind of life. Are we then encouraging our students to think critically about how science, technology and innovation can help them? Are we helping them to see how to aggregate what they have in economics, in geopolitics, in environmental and societal challenges to see how to use the knowledge they are acquiring to provide solutions? Yes, indeed, there are many opportunities with us. Uh, online. Mr. Hugo has set up a huge library. He has a lot of knowledge. We can access a lot of things. That's a great opportunity we should jump on to. Data in our research books. I know students, undergraduates, postgraduates have done a lot of researches. Can they now be changed into e-data so that they can be assessed, accessed by many more students? One of the presentations in the past before me was indicating we can now recruit many more students and some can learn by e from their homes. But how will they access information? We need to use what we have now to be able to reach out to them. How about the possibility of conducting online courses? And again, that will help us reach many more learners. It will be cheaper. They will definitely pay fees, but it will be cheaper than them coming to rent a little room here and look for food and all these things. Then we have an opportunity that the systems we now have can give us regular updates. Regular updates uh, on programs, and so our programs, our academic programs, which I had the VC talking about, can quickly be updated by using IT, ICT systems. Continuous professional development for our lecturers, but also for our alumni. Can we help them? Can we find out whether they are up to date? And this can be done through uh, the IT systems. What are the challenges? The challenges are many, but they are surmountable. The cost of internet is still high. Uh, the low penetration, which creates inequality. Some people up in the mountains of Kisoro may not have internet. 
we have data security and privacy challenge. It's now much easier for people to get into our systems and our lives when we don't know. Infrastructure to run e-courses is still a, a big expense and it's a challenge. Power in some areas, if we are to establish hubs across the southwestern region for BSU, are we assured of power and internet there? Then the attitude and the slow uptake of IT by both the lecturers and the students is a challenge. Can we change our attitude and change our mind? And then as I've just said, the continuous and rapid changes in technology. What strategies can higher institutions adopt? One, accelerating work reskilling. We need to reskill our lecturers and all those we work with so that they are up to date with ICT. Restructuring our institutions provide new science programs across the board. It doesn't matter whether you are doing BCom. You can still serve some minimal uh, science course that will help you uh, navigate through this uh, fourth industrial revolution. Sourcing for trained workers, you know, experts. As I keep telling people, our children, our young people are natives of this industrial revolution. For us, we are migrants. So can we bring them on board and they work with us? to improve ourselves. And what the Bishop said is my last point here, the ethical thinking and intercultural awareness and, and critical thinking. If we leave out the ethics and the fear of God, then we'll be doomed in this industrial revolution. Developing programs that will shift emphasis from just routine tasks, much more to soft skills that will enable these children and these learners to progress. Developing the capacity, not just to analyze and break things into scientific, uh, a scientific problem, but also to be able to uh, emphasize the interconnectedness of issues, the holistic way of looking at life and its challenges and answers. And finally, on this strategy, to regularly develop programs and curricula that students can, can help students think. Again, I want to say it again, unless we train our learners to think, then we are doomed in this fourth industrial revolution. So as I conclude, I would like to say that although we have this industrial revolution and it is still ongoing, we shouldn't throw away our old bits at the moment. We need to have an integration. We need to have an integration of what we've been doing with what we are venturing into. I had uh, the, the, the survey it said uh, six or something are not ready. It's true, but we have to do things progressively. We shouldn't jump and over jump and fall into the river, but we can progress. So I'm saying that we need to have a mix between technology driven systems, which are gaining more and more popularity, and they are a must with our traditional way of delivering education, which is extremely vital because the one to one can never be left out. The role of a teacher, a lecturer, a mentor, a coach will still be there. But this now should work as facilitators that excite young people to search for knowledge and be able to fit in this present industrial revolution. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Kedres, for that elaborate presentation. May the Lord continue to use you. There is one question for you from public, Dr. Kedres. I request you clarify on it. Do you think the government has done enough to prepare institutions and universities of learning for the false industrial revolution from public? You can clarify, Dr. Kedres, as we prepare to hear from Dr. Patrick Pitature on how should universities strategize themselves in the false industrial revolution on business sector. Thank you so much, Doctor. Yes, thank you, Anne. Yes, um, your question is whether they've done it, whether government has done enough. Maybe it hasn't yet done enough, but we have policies and systems in place to expand the backbone. Nita U is committed to that and it has been doing it. We have commitment to have an e-government and e-systems. And um, um, the government recognizes the fact actually that universities are independent and that should be very critical for universities in your independence as universities. What are you innovatively doing that can help you as government uh, supports you to move forward? So we may not have done enough at the moment, but as I said, it's a progression 
but we are committed to ensuring that actually the industrial revolution of the fourth level is not leaving Uganda behind. Thank you so much, Dr. Kedras. I will request you keep answering questions on E on two and A electronically. Thank you so much. I take the honor if we go back to the program to invite Dr. Patrick Bitature to educate the masses on this webinar on how should universities strategize themselves in the fourth industrial revolution in business sector. Who is Dr. Patrick Bitature? Dr. Patrick Bitature is a Ugandan businessman and in he is a founder and chairman of the Timber and a historical company with interest in telecoms, energy production, mining, media, real estate, travel, and leisure. He is the co owner of Brito Hotels. He is reported to be one of the wealthiest individuals in Uganda. Dr. Patrick, in his, in his early life, he was born on 10th May 1960 in Fort Potro, Kabarore district in the Western region of Uganda. He was the first born in the middle class family. When he was 13 years old, his father was murdered during the Idamin regime. He then became the breadwinner of the family. He started tra trading in sugar, clothing, shoes, and foreign currencies. Later, he expanded into mobile telephones and mobile, and mobile airtime distribution. His education background. Dr. Tat Patrick Bitature attended Namasagari College in Kamuru District for his O-level education. While there, he was mentored by Demia Grams. He later attended Nyakasura School in Fort Potro, Kamaru District for his A-level education. He then studied at the London School of Accountancy in the United Kingdom. He then joined the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators. Dr. Patrick holds the rank of Fellow of the Institute. In 2013, he was awarded an honorary doctorate degree by the United Graduate College and Seminary International based in Asu North Carolina. Dr. Vitature, I am humbled to invite you to make your presentation on how should universities strategize themselves in the fourth industrial revolution in the business sector. You are most welcome. Thank you. I hope I am unmuted. Yes, doctor. Hear me. First of all, I must salute you all, especially the Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, and all the speakers who have spoken before me, and I greet all of those who will speak after. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, a lot has been said about the Fourth Industrial Revolution and the relationship with the university, so I do not want to repeat, and I will use pictures to move my presentation as quickly as possible. I hope that my presentation is being shared and is visible to everybody. Do you see the picture, Madam Administrator? Doctor, I am seeing everything clear and loud. Very good. I will move Thank quite quickly in the interest of time because a lot has been said about the industrial revolutions, but I will pick out the milestones. What makes the difference? Now, whether they are lecturers on, 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 on board right now or students, I think it will be useful for them. Why did America stand out so much more, yet the Industrial Revolution began maybe in Britain? Because there were a few champions, captains of business, that really read, led the revolution. And when I talk about this, I talk about the men who built America. And there were six men who built America. There's a W missing at the beginning of WHO. The six men were John D. Rockefeller, Cornelius Vanderbilt, Andrew Carnegie, JP Morgan, Thomas Edison and Henry Ford, because these people touched the very sensitive areas and they made a fortune by solving the people's problems. Rockefeller in oil and gas, Cornelius with the trains, Andrew Carnegie with steel, JP Morgan with banking, Thomas Edison with electricity, Henry Ford with the locomotion, 
the vehicle industry. These things transformed America to make it the country that it is today, number one in the world. So when we talk about the revolution, a revolution has happened globally, but where are the milestones? What made the difference? Now to me, an area that I took particular interest in was that of electricity, because that was a real stimuli, a catalyst, a major trigger in the revolution. Now, whether it was Thomas Edison or Nikolai Tesla who discovered the electricity because Thomas Edison was skewing towards DC and the other was Tesla was skewing towards AC, alternating current. At the end of the day, it was electricity that caused the biggest revolution. Whether it was in Britain, America, anywhere else, electricity made a big difference. So when we talk about industrial revolution in Uganda, a country that has had such an inadequate supply of electricity for so long, this is the first time we have an oversupply against demand with Karuma and Isimba coming on stream. Now we should stay ahead of the curve. Then we can have real change, real transformation. Otherwise, without electricity, it was just a joke. In Umemo, we have been doing what we call demand side management, trying to manage the demand, giving people bulbs that will use less electricity rather than trying to sell more electricity. Another major milestone was medical services. And a major breakthrough was in the discovery of penicillin in 1928, Alexander Fleming. He discovered this in St. Mary's Hospital, literally by accident. But that changed things. Can you imagine before antibiotics operating people, cutting them open and healing them to make sure that they get better without antibiotics? A woman giving birth and having a C-section without antibiotics? That was a major milestone. Of course, there have been several other advances thereafter. Things like the x-ray, because people didn't know what was wrong, whether you had an accident, what bones were broken, what damage was in your brain or inside your body, in your head, without technology. So these were major breakthroughs in science and technology. Around 1920, the radio was discovered. A few years later, television was discovered. This meant people could learn through different ways. Communication was enhanced, a major step. Then movement, part of locomotion, air travel, it was not until 1935 that the Wrights brothers who discovered commercial air travel made sense of what was happening around the world. Imagine the way this disease, Corona, has spread globally as compared to the pandemic 100 years ago. The speed of which it traveled this time because of air travel. Because people can be in the other side of the globe in a matter of hours. A big difference. Towards the end of Second World War, because of so much fighting, between the First World War and Second World War and people trying to expand. The Kalishnikov was discovered by a Russian called Mikhail Kalishnikov at the end of 1945. But until today, it is still the most popular uh, firearm used for, for fierce confrontation. So back to the Industrial Revolution. What was it all about? Of course, we know that Industrial Revolution was about steam, the use of steam and, uh, and, and, uh, and how, we, how we can use steam to, to make a difference. In, in making machines work better. That was the first one, and a lot has been said about it. I will not spend time. But what was important around that time was the use of politics. People started fighting for their rights. Now, the most popular man around the world probably who talked about civil rights was Martin Luther King. But that didn't stop only there. It went across the globe to India, to Asia, and here in Africa, Kwame Nkrumah, and until very recently, Nelson Mandela. Everyone was fighting for their civil rights. If you don't have civil rights, people cannot progress. It became important. That's where their political dimension came in, social change. But then what about people's silver rights? Silver rights are just as important as civil rights. The difference is this means people's wealth, people having equity, being part of it. Others, this inequity, the gap between the rich and the poor widening continuously is dangerous for society and is not sustainable. It has been going on for a long time. And again here, where is Uganda with property ownership? Our silver rights. Are there rights that people fight for? I see the, the pandemonium caused when they are going for elections, even just within the party, because of civil rights. They know their civic responsibilities. What about their silver rights? Are we doing enough to ignite that? We talk about moving from the first industrial revolution to the fourth, yet people have not understood what their civil rights and silver rights are. Because in the first revolution before it was really agriculture based. And we are proud to keep saying Uganda is largely an agriculture based economy. 78% of our population depending on it. That's not good enough. We've got to transform these people. But we can't because we have been exploited for far too long. 
When I look at Africa, the slave trade that lasted 400 years of exploitation from the year 1484 to 1807. That, the damage that was done was severe. We are still recovering. Yet we gloss over it. It is so important, it's fundamental, it's critical because the wealth created in the Western world was largely because of 400 years of exploitation. Between the first revolution, industrial revolution, and the fourth, it's only 150 years. But this exploitation of slave trade was for 400 years. Put that in perspective. Beyond that, after the slave trade, we had colonialism, which was again economic exploitation. And that went on for quite a long time. Not as long as slave trade, but certainly for about 70 or 80 years. After that, we went into neocolonialism, which was again further exploitation. Many of us still live under the yoke of neocolonialism. Whereas we move from slave trade, now it is the Western world controlling us with debt, whether it's World Bank, IMF, or other instruments, and also the Chinese, industry, the Chinese countries today that have extended a lot of loans, which we need, but then we are held, we are chained to them. So need, people need to understand this from a holistic perspective. I will not go into the brief history of Uganda, but you know about the stages we have gone through from the days of Kabaka, and then how we went into the period, the terrible regime of Idi Amin, and how that set us back as a country. So when you talk about fourth industrial revolution, you've got to understand where we are coming from until 1986, when the rule of law was restored. And there, whew, a breath of fresh air came in. That made a fundamental difference. We are beginning from, not from zero, but from minus 10, and we have been building from then. It's only been 35 odd years where we, we take this peace for granted. We must do everything to maintain this rule of law Otherwise, everything else falls apart without peace and security. And peace is not just the absence of war. It's the presence of justice and equality for all. And that is fundamental. Now, let's look at how we navigate the Industrial Revolution. I'll not go into this again because we know that it began with the first Industrial Revolution. The second was largely about electricity. The third was about computers and automated production. And the fourth is about cyber physical systems. It is actually still happening. We have not really arrived in it. It's a convergence of all the others and things are still happening to really say that we are in the fourth industrial revolution. So what is it all about? The fourth revolution is largely about velocity. It's about scope and systems impact. The speed of current breakthroughs has no historical precedent. The fourth Revolution is evolving at such an exponential rate because it grows exponentially rather than linear. And it's disrupting every industry. Many of them don't realize how they've already been affected, but they will be feeling it's rough. The breadth and depth of these changes heralds transformation in everything from management and governance to the future. And what has made it happen in the last 20 years, even for us in Africa, is the possibility of billions, not millions, but billions of people connected by mobile devices. You don't have to have a static workshop computer. A mobile phone is powerful, so powerful. It has unprecedented processing power. In the past, computers had to have, have a whole building for one computer. Now, a small handheld device has so much processing capacity, so much storage capacity, and access to knowledge is unlimited. Now, like the revolutions before it that preceded the fourth industrial revolution, it has the potential to raise people's incomes. And that's what's most important today. The global income levels can shoot up because of this knowledge, and it will improve the quality of life of the populations around the world. To date, those who have gained the most have been the consumers, being able to get affordable services to access the digital world. Technology has made new products and services that increase the efficiency and pleasure of our personal lives, like ordering for a taxi, booking a plane, a flight on a plane, buying a product, making a payment, whether it's mobile money, and peso or any other listening to music digitally, watching movies, playing games, and all these can be done remotely in the comfort of your home. That's been a major difference. But now the future is going to be about technological innovation, which will have a huge impact on the supply side of, on the supply side of goods and services. It will actually be what I call the supply side miracle, with long-term gains in efficiency and productivity. And COVID has actually accelerated this process. It was happening, but this impact of COVID lately has accelerated everything. Everything is going to go e-commerce much faster. It has been a stimuli. Now look at transportation and communication costs. These will drop globally. Logistics and global supply chains will change fundamentally. They'll become more effective. Amazon just shot up in the last eight months to number one by far 
his wealth has increased by almost $100 billion because of communication, transport, logistics. And with the cost of trade, cost of trade will start coming down and this will open up new markets and drive economic growth. The question is, where is Uganda? Where is Africa in this revolution? The impact will not just be on business, but also on the government. As the physical and digital and biological worlds continue to converge, new technologies and platforms will increasingly enable citizens to engage with governments. They will voice their opinions. We shall coordinate our efforts. People's efforts will be coordinated much better. And they will even circumvent the supervision of public authorities. Look at what's happening with Big Brother in China, more so maybe Hong Kong. They have cameras everywhere, and there's a lot of surveillance. Look at the mass demonstrations that happened in the US recently because of Black Lives Matter. Look at what's happening in Belarus after the, the, the elections where people have been on a revolt and have defied the elections for now almost 40 days. These things are going to continue because of the power of communication. Simultaneously, the other side, government will gain new technological powers to increase their control over their populations based on pervasive surveillance systems and the ability to control the digital infrastructure, especially now with face recognition CCTV. Any crime, behavior, China is controlling behavior of its citizens using this. On the whole, governments will increasingly face pressure, however, to change their current approach to public engagement and policy making. As their central role of conducting policy diminishes owing to new resources of competition and the redistribution and decentralization of power that new technologies make possible because of the fourth industrial revolution that we are entering. Ultimately, the ability of government systems and public authorities to adapt will determine their survival. If they prove capable of embracing a world of disruptive change, subjecting their structures to the levels of transparency and efficiency that will enable them to maintain their competitive advantage, because that's all they have, then they will endure. If they cannot evolve, they will face increasing trouble, as we have seen clearly in the case of Hong Kong. Many of you have followed it internationally. This will be particularly true in the realm of regulation. Current systems of public policy and decision making evolved alongside second industrial revolution, when decision makers had time to study a specific issue and develop the necessary responses or appropriate regulatory framework. The whole process was designed to be linear and mechanistic following a strict top-down approach. And this was amplified during the second uh, industrial revolution. Given the fourth industrial revolution's rapid pace of change and broad impacts, legislators, regulators are being challenged to an unprecedented degree. And for the most part, are proving unable to cope. Look at how far back mobile money transfer has left the central bank laws and regulations. Not even the telecom UCC regulators are keeping pace Things are moving so fast. We're just trying to pass the laws in the central bank now about, uh, about um, mobile money and how it should be regulated. How then can they preserve the interests of the consumers and the public at large while continuing to support innovation and technological development? The key word here is by embracing agility. You must be agile, both the customers and the governance, the government. Just as the private sector has increasingly adopted agile responses to software development, and business operations most generally. Agility is key because of the speed of change. The fourth industrial revolution will also profoundly impact the nature of national and international security, affecting both the probability and the nature of conflict. The use of remote drones for surveillance and execution. The history of warfare and international security is and has always been the history of technological innovation. And today is no exception. Regulators must continuously adapt to the new fast-changing environment, reinventing themselves so they can truly understand what it is that they are regulating, because the world is moving at a supersonic space. To do so, governments and regulatory agencies will need to collaborate closely with business and civil society. Modern conflicts involving states are increasingly now hybrid in nature. I call this hybrid because it's combining tra traditional battlefield techniques with elements previously associated with non-state actors. The distinction between war and peace, combatant and non-combatant, and even violence and non-violence. Think about cyber warfare. In becoming, is becoming uncomfortably blurry. The lines are no longer clear, the distinctions. With the advent of COVID, His Excellency the President stated that we are now at war. That was in his first speech to the public. 
because it was a biological germ warfare that had started in Wuhan, but had spread all over the world. And so he said, we are now at war. So war is taking different forms and it's going to happen everywhere and no one will escape. As this process takes place and new technologies such as autonomous or biological weapons become easier to use, individuals, just individuals and small groups will become increasingly a problem, will increasingly join states and be capable of causing mass harm. It's not about throwing a grenade now. Cyber warfare, one guy with a click of a button can disrupt the whole system of a country. The new vulnerabilities will lead to new fears. But at the same time, advances in technology will create the potential to reduce the scale or impact of violence through the development of new modes of protection. For example, greater precision in targeting. We have seen how the advancement of drones has helped the American government. They can pinpoint an individual or a terrorist in a car in another country and they detonate the, a bomb on that specific target remotely while sitting in America. The impact on people, the masses, the fourth industrial revolution will finally, will finally, will not change only what we do, but also who we are. It will affect our identity and all the issues associated with it. Our sense of privacy, our notion of ownership, our consumption patterns, the time we devote to work and leisure, and how we develop our careers, cultivate our skills, meet people, dating, boyfriend, girlfriend, not this Kuhinjira style, and how we nurture relationships. All these things will change because of this advancement in technology. To do this, however, we must develop a comprehensive and globally shared view of how technology is affecting our lives and reshaping our economic, social, cultural, and human environments. There has never been a time of greater promise or one of greater potential of peril. So we must be fully alert. Today's decision makers, however, are too often trapped in traditional linear thinking or are too absorbed by the multiple crises, crises demanding their attention to think strategically about the forces of disruption and innovation shaping our future. Shaping our future together is a prerequisite for peaceful coexistence. The need, and I emphasize, the need for regional cooperation in the fight against cybercrime at the internet exchange, ideally for East Africa, the internet exchange would have been in Mombasa, wherever these optic fiber cables come in. And then a node should be in Nairobi, one in, in Kampala, one in Dar es Salaam. They need to work together. These things are not happening. The fight against extremism by monitoring and surveillance. The fight against terrorism using drones, CCTVs, networks, integrated data resources. We cannot succeed by doing it alone. We have seen what's happened to Somalia with all the technologies being used. We need cooperation and that cooperation is a must for us to have social economic transformation. I want to stop there. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Patrick. Before you leave the mic, I have two questions from public where I request you put a clarification, but otherwise we are all humbled with that elaborate presentation. And I pray that the next time when BSU engages you, kindly honor the request. We are all humbled here. Thank you so much. The two questions, does the fourth industrial revolution present a human resource or it is bringing a rich, poor segmentation threat? And the second one, can the fourth industrial revolution be a solution to food security in, I quote, hungry Africa? Thank you so much, Dr. Patrick. Very quickly, on that first question, does it present a, 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 a resource promise or a peril? In one of my graphs, one of my presentation slides, I mentioned there, there has never been a time of greater promise which is full of potential, or one of greater potential peril, also danger. It is equally balanced. It's how we embrace it. And if we work together, if you try to do things alone, like North Korea is doing things alone, you will have issues. But if you can embrace a cooperation and understanding, especially amongst yourselves in the regional groups, forget about African Union, but at least East Africans, it will be a bigger promise. Also, it addresses the question of food security. I talked about inequality social inequality, income inequality. That divide is not sustainable. We've got to find a way to bring everybody on board. We can leave nobody behind. 
economic transformation, social economic transformation must be for all. I am glad the government has, has been talking the talk. Now the challenge is to walk the walk. We had serious impediments, especially infrastructure and electricity. Now many of those have been overcome. So now we must use technology to make sure we have social economic transformation that is meaningful to everybody and leave nobody behind. Finding oil is not the question. How we use our human resource, our biggest potential is there. I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Patrick. According to the program, we are now going to listen from the, the regulator of universities, National Council for Higher Education, rightly represented by Dr. Nora Murira on how should universities strategize themselves in the fourth industrial revolution. Who is Dr. Nora Murira? Dr. Nora is a renowned ICT specialist in information systems and service development. She worked as a data analyst for the Health Statistics Management and Information Grant in the Department of Health and Social Security, Elephant and Castle, London. She also worked as a director and a senior lecturer in the Institute of Computer Science in the Directorate of Information and Communication Technology, Makerere University. She had also worked as an ICT research incubator in IDRC, Nairobi. She's currently working as a director of search National Council for Higher Education. Dr. Nora is a founding partner, Knowledge Consulting Limited. Dr. Nora holds a PhD in service systems development from Deputy University of Technology in the Netherlands. She also holds a postgraduate diploma in management information systems and has a Master of Science from the prestigious London School of Economics, University of London, UK. Dr. Nora has other awards from University of Cambridge and Harvard University. Dr. Nora was recognized with award from her contribution to ICD4D, notably for the International Women Forum Leadership Foundation. Dr. Nora, you are most welcome, and all antennas of public viewers are up, waiting to listen from you. You are most welcome. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator, uh, for that kind introduction. My Lord Bishop, the Vice Chancellor, uh, Bishop Stewart University, distinguished uh, uh, participants, uh, panelists, and speakers. I am humbled and I appreciate this opportunity to represent the National Council for Higher Education at this conference. I thank you, Madam VC, for this invitation, which is a follow-up from our last um, from our last meeting, where we had where we had the National Council hosting the 4IR uh, digital direction for for higher education. I would like to just a moment. I would like to uh, applaud the previous speakers and uh, they have all in their different dockets uh, highlighted the issues that we are faced with when we are talking about the 4IR. And most importantly, the last speaker has given us uh, a synopsis of the milestones as well as the ethical development issues that we need to look at if we are to harness the if we are to harness the 4IR. My speech, uh, sorry, my presentation is going to be around the regulation, higher education regulation lens. And I'll skip some of the, some of the slides I have because previous speakers have already talked about that. This is the content of my presentation with an introduction. I'll go into the policy and strategic framework for the 4IR at the national level, which anchors us the digital vision for the education sector, 
the status of ICT challenges, university strategies, and the regulation, uh, regulation angle for strategizing for 4R and a conclusion. I'll not uh, delve into the elements of the 4R. It has been talked about uh, uh, competently by the previous speakers. We are all on the same page, I believe, given the preamble we have had with three industrial revolutions, and we are now in the frontier. This is a frontier technology. As Dr. Tature said, there's so much that is unknown. Some of it can be fear mongering, depending on what uh, will actually unfold, but there is a lot of potential here and a lot of potential hazards. It all depends on how ethically we handle this. And I go back to the Bishop's uh, beginning when she talked about ethical issues at the center of harnessing the 4IR for good use because technology can also be put to bad use. So this is my introduction really, noting the, uh, the global revolution and the 4IR uh, ability to transform skills and expertise. This has been talked about in the way goods and services are produced, consumed and distributed and the changes that this technology has given. To succeed in the 4IR requires skills. That has been well uh, talked about. The ability to quickly learn commercially attractive skills. Because we have to be competent, competitive, and we have to be relevant. And we do not exist in a bubble, whether it's an institution, whether it is a country. The ability to apply these skills in a practical sense that is getting to needs that uh, address people's, uh, people's issues. And the ability to create technical innovations alongside multiple disciplinary teams. So universities have this critical role of creating an education ecosystem that will provide the high-end skills. The key word here is on high-end because we have the whole scope from basic your ordinary citizen is going to have to learn the basic skills, the digital skills are for everyone, but universities are challenged on the high end to create and participate in economic opportunities in the 4IR. We need to understand the policy and strategic framework at the national level. And here, it is important for us, it is also good for us to know that we are in tandem with the national vision. 2040 calls for ICT skills development. And in this extract on your screens, which I have put forward, it says Uganda shall develop, improve, and retool its ICT talent building mechanism by adopting globally benchmarked industry rated skills assessment and training and certification standards. And the last sentence here for universities, especially, ICT shall be mainstreamed in education to take advantage of ICT enabled learning and to prepare future generations of IT savvy workers and ensure that uh, ensure their effective utilization. This vision is supported by the National Development Plan 3 Digital Transformation Program as well as that National 4 Task Force which the President appointed. So this is critical, critical to the nation and universities are challenged to produce the skills that will uh, drive this 4IR, uh, uh, the, the, 4IR uh, the 4IR forward. So that is the policy and strategic framework. We are in good hands and we need to look at how we strategize at both the institutional level and both the sectoral the, and the, the institutional level as well as as a group of universities. At the education sector level, we have the strategic plan. It is calling for the same thing, computer skills at tertiary institutions. There is an education digital agenda under development currently that's been funded by UNESCO and UNICEF, and it calls for uh, a development of this agenda that, that will provide the necessary framework to optimize the coordination of diverse opportunities for this process of designing, development, implementation and integration of ICT in education. There are many silos in education. There are many different fragmented projects in the education sector that need to be harmonized. Even as we move forward, before we actually embrace fully 
the 4IR. We need to harmonize these projects to gain uh, from, the different, uh, from the different aspects, either at institutional level collaboration or at cross-sectoral level. So the digital agenda for education, for the education sector is underway. Now, we understand that ICT is the backbone of this strategy. What is the status of ICT in universities? Universities and, higher, and the higher education subsector in general are really in transition of integrating these ICTs in learning, teaching, and research. There are institutions, and very few of them, that have adopted high-end systems, e-learning systems, even assessment systems that are online. And then there are those who are the majority who are just starting out and have basic systems, basic infrastructure. So we have those disparities. Growing, uh, rather, we recognize that there is a need to strategize for the 4IR. Indeed, BSU's uh, webinar today is uh, an indication of that growing recognition. The council held a 4IR conference in March this year, just before the lockdown, and it's uh, much appreciated that this is followed up at institu institutional level, underscoring the importance of grappling with what we need to do as a sector, as a subsector for higher education. Now, the Council conducted a nationwide higher education institution e readiness survey that was completed in 2019 at the end. And we have a summary of the findings that will put into perspective what we are going to be dealing with as we move into this high, uh, highly uh, capital intensive fourth industrial revolution. So when we talk about the internet capacity, all our universities are below the required minimum of at least one GPPS per 1,000 students. For the city infrastructure and management information systems, 90% of our higher education institutions lacked secure central servers. 23% uh, have adopted e-learning systems, and that is taking into account even those who have just adopted these systems for, for continued learning under the COVID lockdown period. Computer student ratio on average stands at 1 to 16. For the ICT skills, there's basic to moderate, very little on the advanced, and very few postdoctoral uh, kind of engagements or research in this area. Research and innovation levels, you can see with the dismal 0.1% uh, budget allocation to research and innovation. There are no high performance, uh, high performance computing facilities, except one that I'll talk about later on. ICT governance and institutional management, 60% lack adequate technical support staff. 75% have no established ICT support units. And when it comes to institutionalizing ICT with policies and dedicated budgets, we have 41% of our private universities without ICT policies and dedicated budgets. Here, I had to applaud BSU for being compliant in this regard. I'm sure you fall within these percentages of the halves which we are looking at and you need to move forward uh, from strength to strength. When it comes to the science, technology, engineering and mathematics enrollment, which is the bedrock skills for the 4IR, we have 35% enrolled. And that is for the data collected 1819, which is below, slightly below the 40% uh, UNESCO recommendation for economic takeoff. So that's the picture we are dealing with for our 4IR pillars. And these constraints can be expounded uh, in my next slides before we get to the actual strategies, the inadequate infrastructure for intermediate and advanced digital skills. There are low levels of computing equipment and internet access that is acknowledged. And even where we have computers in institutional labs, it was found that these, it, this equipment is so old that it's unable in some cases to support modern software we are moving into a very modern technology. This was the report of the digital, uh, uh, digital economy for Africa 
World Bank report of 2019. I've already talked about the computer student ratio, the lack of high performance computing facilities for data analytics and research, and this uh, lack of these facilities will hinder the development of research in this area, especially machine learning and artificial intelligence. We have an outdated curriculum, and I think this is acknowledged across all universities. We normally at the National Council conduct minimum standards for all different disciplines with you, the universities, because that's where the experts are. In 2014, the standards barely mentioned the AI, they barely mentioned IoT or data analytics, which are the hot topics in the digital economy. So our work is cut out for us. The digital skills at the tertiary level, we acknowledge that there is generally a low gross enrollment ratio. And we have only about 35% of people enrolled in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics courses. I've already talked about that. This is likely to lead to a reduced supply of highly skilled ICT professionals. Inclusiveness. Previous speakers have talked about this. No one should be left behind. This is echoed within the sustainable development goals. There is a low level of awareness as universities are grappling with funding constraints. They have not been able to include enough women uh, in, in, in technology, nor have they been able to cater for the PWDs. When you look for data for women in STEM, they are about 30%. This is data collected from Macquarie University in uh, the Rendere report, uh, visitation report, only 30%. When you look for data of PWDs who have access to digital resources, it is very scanty. It can hardly be found, which means there is a very big gap here when we have uh, we are looking at an all-inclusive technology and all these icons are putting forward what the areas are because disability in many cases have been defined by many people in different ways but it has to be all encompassing now this is the heart of this conference of this webinar what are the strategies for the 4 looking at what is we are stuck with as universities but i think it was uh, it was uh, Dr. Turiagenda who said that this is not insurmountable. What do we need as universities to deliberately leverage uh, position, reposition ourselves to provide technical and practical expertise that's needed for FOIA, especially the artificial intelligence tools, because they are the ones that are associated with general development as well as employment. Both we shall experience this as this industry revolution garners steam, both here as a country and outside, within the region as we federate and even beyond. So the four IR strategies should be integrated into the current on planning cycle at individual higher education institutions and collectively to leverage numbers. The VC forum should take this up as one of their priority agendas to negotiate in many different forums to overcome the kind of challenges we have just shared. When it comes to infrastructure, we need to expand and improve broadband connectivity and access to ICT devices. What do we do here? We can negotiate with government. Government has uh, this national backbone infrastructure, the, uh, the, the e-government e infrastructure that is offering MDAs, uh, government agencies connectivity. But we need to look at it in a broad manner. Universities which are public here are only nine. The rest are private universities. When we are negotiating here, we must talk about all universities to negotiate for those who need that last mile connectivity because this project has completed three phases of national coverage and it became operational in 2013, 2014 and reduced internet bandwidth costs from $1,200 per Mbps down now to, if you are subscribed by ITIU, it is at 70 and further reductions borne out. More if we are an education institution. These are the negotiations we are going to take, not as public, not as private universities. We can negotiate 
with telecom companies for education access rates, including zero rating. I think Makerere did this during the lockdown so that we can have access both increasing our space and time in terms of interacting with education materials, education and, uh, uh, and training materials. We need to establish those minimum requirements, ICT requirements, which are essentially the pillars I talked about for the foyer. We need to provide a minimum set of appropriate computing devices. This can be taken from a strategy which is becoming increasingly, increasingly popular, which is bring your own device for university students through a loan or subsidy scheme. What university need to do though, is because of the diversity of these devices, there has to be control and registration of these devices on the institutional network. We need to look at curriculum orientation because it's outdated. We review and reorient curricula to enable research and innovation. Let's integrate like some people, I think universities like Chambogo did introduce components of 4IR in ongoing curricula, even at that time in March when we held, uh, when we held our conference. We need to strengthen uh, knowledge discovery. Again, this is cross-cutting. It's not just about the engineering, uh, the STEM side of things, because everyone is involved in this. All disciplines are involved in this revolution. Those skills that will improve emotional intelligence, critical thinking, problem solving, cut across the board. This should be conducted uh, for priority for our displays. For example, geospatial data analysis are the STEM and the, human, uh, the humanities uh, focused disciplines. Under curriculum review again, this is now focusing on those areas within the law and, uh, and humanities where we need to fill uh, fields like law and commerce where we can deploy related courses, which may require designing of new courses and content. For example, this may relate to technology ethics, platform economics. The most common uh, platform economics are the transaction ones. I think they have been alluded to by all the speakers. The, the law needs to move and adapt itself to the changing digital space for jurisdiction. And this means there is a need now to reevaluate some of the issues, some of the components of our courses here. Today we talk about cyber laws, and therefore this is within that vein of reviewing our curriculum to be relevant as we strategize for the 4IR. We provide ICT research infrastructure. I talked about the high performance computing. Uh, high performance computing. Here uh, I said that there are very few here although they are very much needed to, for the development of uh, skilled data analysts and the development of skills like machine learning and artificial intelligence, which are key uh, in the 4IR. There is uh, one, one, uh, one university, and that is Makerere, which is hosting an AI and data science research hub. It is one of the few, one of the very few in Africa, but we need more. We also do realize that these are, these are uh, investments that will require a lot of money. So we can adopt a center of excellence model for sharing these scarce resources. Let's strengthen innovation that has been talked about. We review and reorient industrial programs. I cannot uh, you know, talk about this more than the institutions out there. Our current industrial programs lack that liaison with especially the private sector. If we are to drive the 4IR, we need business relevant incubation, business relevant research that the, the, the private sector can buy into and therefore be able to support. We need direct startups to, uh, to skilled innovators and facilitating internships with private sector linkages. We need to provide low cost or free infrastructure support in, in, in innovators. This is in the incubators at institutional level. The Ministry of, uh, the Ministry of uh, Information, is it Information, Science, Science and, Science and Innovation, it's mostly Science, um, Technology and Information, is putting forward a project of developing uh, business and technology incubators at the university. 
Therefore, when this project comes to you, I think we know where to put the four IR incubators. We, we know where to put, what to put within these incubators. What will be the front runner in our research for within these incubators? Who will be the students that we put forward? These are the innovators that should be moving those projects that the private sector or the larger development world is interested in. We need to educate our innovators about intellectual property rights and registration. People need to understand, our students need to understand as they innovate, what is pre-incubation, what is during incubation, what is post-incubation, where are the markets, where do we register? And this can be uh, provided by the URSB expert talks, registration service. Some institutions have, um, have invited these, mainly to inform your innovators, tomorrow's innovators, about what the potential is out there. When I produce a product, how do I go in through the cycle? Where can I talk? Uh, what, how, can I, how, how can I register uh, that, that product, the patents, and so on? So this is important at institutional level as we strategize. On the regulation side, I've said that we do this with you, the universities review and fast track our legal and policy strategic framework. We need to prioritize as we negotiate our funding scheme for university for our capacity building, including the public-private partnership arrangements. I think the issue of partnerships has been said by many speakers, but here I'm talking about what is a reality out there. The bishop talked about it. Every speaker has talked about this. This is uh, an investment that will require a lot of funding, that will require subsidies, that will require government to rethink the way it funds higher education. I'll not go into the funding of higher education. I think you know it better than I do, but it is dismal. And when we are talking about the 4IR, we need to factor this in as we get our strategies for negotiation. We need to strengthen our accreditation system for STEM so that we, we have institutions that can fast track STEM lecturers, we are putting together a project for national PhD programs that will sustain, will sustain a, a technology like this. Sustain because it needs to look at the whole working environment of a lecturer, as well as the facilities where they teach from. We need to, to look at the teaching modalities. Recently, the National Council developed the open distance and electronic learning minimum standards, again, assisted with the experts from the universities, and these were disseminated. Under the COVID period to support co uh, continued learning, we disseminated the emergency Odell. To date, there are a few, about 17 or so institutions that have signed up. So we need, first of all, to get within this revolution where we are, this current stage as we're transiting, let's get the basics done. How do we get every other university to be mainstream on teaching and learning techniques? How good are your lecturers in developing uh, learning materials? Do you have learning management systems? Can we have conduct assessment online? We need to develop an ICT accreditation and qualification framework that will assess the core competences. I talked about this, that this is a digital economy that will have to have digital skills all the way from the basics. So the national digital skills framework, which I've abbreviated here in brackets, will be that uh, that framework that will define that those competences. What basics do you need to have to participate in the digital economy? And of course, we are not reinventing the wheel. We just need to develop this to fit within our context. But remember, universities are providing the high-end skills for the fire and other emerging technologies. We need to foster inclusivity talked about that. Include targeted gender and equity strategies for access to digital learning resources. Uh, we need to reach out and skill school youths for higher diploma programs under TVET and even learners from remote regions because now we have the means to do so and other marginalized groups. So in conclusion, the 4IR has many opportunities for our universities in terms of improving our learning outcomes. What we need to take forward 
is a parallel strategy, a determined strategy that will take individual higher education institutions and coordination at the higher level, I say at the VC forum level, of combined institutional force to influence policy and strategic frameworks, negotiate solutions to navigate the major challenges that will require substantial changes. Substantial changes. Before you even do anything, your reforms in terms of employment, in terms of pol policy employment, will have to change, including uh, the change management that is required within your institution. Changes uh, with, uh, that have uh, denote a huge capital investment to the science and technology curricula, mainly, but we also review across the board, ICT infrastructure learning and teaching skills. This is um, an extract from a focus group discussion we have just conducted for our stakeholder engagement with universities. And I wanted to throw it out there. The usage of in learning. So are you making use of the emerging fire technologies in those areas? When this uh, presentation is shared, I believe we can be able to share your institutional, cross-institutional experiences, and they can be sent to that email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nora, for that elaborate and technical presentation. We are so grateful to listen to you. Before you leave the platform, there are two questions from the public. One, what opportunities does the 4IR automated systems present for Uganda and Africa during this COVID-19 pandemic? Two, how can CHE as a regulator to private universities lobby government to subsidize on taxes to enable it, to enable private universities improve and invest in ICT infrastructures? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, opportunities uh, for our during this pandemic. I think communication is one of the issues since we are immobile. It has been talked about that we have to have learning, uh, online learning, one of the, those things for continued education. And we, cannot, we can only expand on this. Uh, we have had within the same communication because of the COVID pandemic to connect border, uh, the border towns and institutions there. I think this was done under, under UCC. One of them would be communication. And of course, all the platform um, uh, transactions that are available for, for people to transact within their locations. That is something I can think of off the cuff. We have this opportunity to develop content as we envisage an online learning or other platforms that will have to be online. On the second issue of the taxes, I've said that this um, negotiation is going to take not only the council as a regulator, but the higher education institutions leveraging their numbers and looking at themselves as a block, not as private and public, because oftentimes uh, support to government goes to the public universities, but this is an effort that requires those to get together. Taxes, um, did I hear that uh, question right up to the end? Yes. Uh, how, mm -hmm. The question was, how can Nche as a regulator for private universities too, help to lobby the government to help those private institutions, universities to enable on tax sub subsidies to enable them invest in ICT infrastructures. Thank Actually, I, I, I more or less have answered this because everywhere we have had, uh, we have interfaced with uh, policy reform, uh, strategic reforms. Uh, recently, we had the Kayanja Committee on uh, the Makere Visitation Committee report. We have been lobbying exactly for this, looking at uh, private universities, not as commercial entities, but as human resource developers. And I think that effort will continue 
for us to lobby as a, as a group. It also needs for us to conduct some maybe more realistic uh, what should I call it, feedback to government in terms of actual needs. What exactly does this uh, entail in terms of equipment, in terms of cost, really, as a project? But this is something that the council is already doing and will continue to do. But moving forward as strategize for the four hour, we need to get together and get some level of detail for negotiation, for negotiating the best outcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nora, once again. Three requests to panelists. I'm requesting that we share presentation through the emails Bishop Stewart used to invite you. And also towards the end, I'll request that we summarize our presentation in two minutes. And, and finally, I request that we continue answering questions electronically. Thank you so much, public here is being excited. Finally, we are on the last presenter, Mr. Stephen Langa, who is going to, to tell the public, how should universities strategize themselves in the fourth industrial revolution on religious sector? And who is Mr. Stephen Langa? Mr. Stephen Langa is the executive director of Family Life Network. He holds a bachelor's degree of science in electrical engineering from Nairobi University. Mr. Stephen has attended several seminars, workshops, conferences, short courses on a variety of subjects, including leadership, management, counseling, transformation, locally and globally, including the Hunger Institute leadership training. Mr. Stephen is a known public, public speaker and conference facilitator to topics related to biblical worldview, parenting, marriage, youth, to mention. Mr. Stephen has pioneered in putting together the creative parenting course, which has transformed the parenting practice of hundreds of parents in Uganda since 2006, which has attracted scholars and academicians in the same course. So Mr. Stephen, I am humbled to invite you. Take the floor. You are most welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm honored to be here and uh, uh, I recognize my Lord Bishop, uh, the VC, our fellow panelists, uh, all protocol observed. I'm thankful for the opportunity to share uh, a few thoughts in the area of uh, how the university can strategize uh, to be relevant in the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, let me just put up my presentation. Uh, there we are. Yeah, so. Um, as a word of introduction, I want to say that uh, um, we have had several uh, rev re re revolutions which have been uh, spoken very well by our, my fellow panelists and uh, we thank God for that. Uh, but I just want to start by underscoring the relevance of Christianity in the industrial revolutions, especially the first one. Uh, I think we all know about the time of the Reformation and the critical role that uh, um, the Bible and Christianity play. We know that the Bible is the foundation of Western civilization. Uh, we heard about uh, the US and how one of our presenters very ably uh, shared how that nation came to prominence. Uh, you see, the American nation was founded on biblical principles, and that's why it's a, it's a thing that has pro been at the foundation of nations uh, that have actually thrived and which have actually have affected or, or been out of influence around the world. 
Now, now, let's look at what the Duke of Wellington said. He said, educate men without religion and you make of them but clever devils. Everybody who has spoken has underscored the importance of values, the importance of morals, the importance of ethics. And uh, I don't need to overemphasize that. Another person, a prominent person, C.S. Lewis, I think a lot of us would know him, especially those of us who are a bit older, great man, one of the great uh, Christian thinkers of the last century. He said, education without values as useful as it is, seems rather to make man a more clever devil. So just emphasizing what uh, the Duke had actually said. Now, look at what uh, Sai Baba says. The politics without principles, education without character, science without humanity, and commerce without morality, are not only useless, but also positively dangerous. As though that's not enough, this, has, this information that has just come uh, during COVID, it actually came on the May 19th. Atheists are warning that Christianity may be necessary for the survival of Western civilization. Atheists, you imagine. And this guy, Tom Holland, is an atheist and has written a book, How the Christian Revolution Made the World. And he is actually defending Christianity. And he's an atheist. And that's because any honest observer or any honest scholar will actually find out that Christianity is key, is essential for the survival of civilizations. Uh, our Lord Bishop, mentioned in his speech about what's happening in the US today, how the country is actually in very serious trouble. In fact, all of us, please, I request you to pray for that nation because the nation is facing the kind of challenge it has not faced in, in our history, simply because forces that are contrary to Christianity, which was the foundation of that nation, are coming to tear it apart. And I want to say categorically that it is impossible to have a sustained civilization without the principles of, the, of Christianity. I mean, history shows it, and we don't have time for that, but that is the naked truth. Now, there's a gentleman, uh, Lawrence, who did a study, about 25 years study about he wondered, why are some nations rich and others are poor? And he did incredible studies. And he came to find out that uh, the mindset of people is actually what determines whether they're going to be in a rich nation or a poor nation. So the issue is not resources, the presence or lack of resources, but it's more the mindset. If people have a mindset that actually bring out a culture of fatalism or inner resignation, then even if they have gold or are sitting on gold, they will be poor. So why is that important and how is that connected to what we're talking about uh, here? Well, studies have, numerous studies have shown that actually uh, the success of someone uh, and this particular study that I quote there, says that all our academic qualifications only contributes 15% of our success. But the staggering 85% depends on one's values, character, and you know, their ability to relate with the other people. So meaning that while academics are there, the greater part of one's success actually are the softer skills and which people call all kinds of names these days but you know, character and values, which are very, very important. And this is where religion comes in because, or Christianity for that matter, because Christianity directly impacts that 85% to improve our 85% where we can now be able to um, have a revolution 
which are actually meaningful and which are going to help people rather than destroy them. Now, it is important for us to understand the times uh, we are living in. And again, to interpret the times and all that, you need Christianity. Because it's the one that looks around and knows going on, what's happening. You remember the sons of Issachar, they looked around and they said, ah, uh ah, -uh, this is what's going to happen. Or this is the season for this or for the other. Why is that important? God is a God who does things in seasons and in times. He's the one who sets the seasons. He's the one who ordains what is going to be the current thing now and so on. And so to the degree that people plug into that program, the more progressive, the better prepared they will be for what they're doing uh, and so on. So we look at Africa now and uh, we have the youngest uh, nation and people have already uh, talked about that. Uh, you can see that by 2050, Africa will be the largest population. Uh, we have the largest amount of natural resources. And you don't have to be a prophet to realize that the 21st century is actually the century for the African continent. This continent that has been described as a dark continent has been looked down upon. This is the century when Africa is going to actually rise and begin to, be, to play her role on the world stage. And therefore, having known that, we, the people who are training Africans and uh, Ugandans, need to catch the vision and align our work with what God is doing and with the destiny of the African continent at this time. So universities, therefore, need to strategize and uh, come up to speed with preparing young men and young women who are going to make Uganda and Africa great nation and continent to be able to utilize the fourth in, uh, industrial revolution. You also need to understand the nature of the conflict today that we are, that before uh, some of us when we were younger, there was the Cold War, which was an arms race. But today, it's an ideological warfare. The issue whose ideas will run the day is the issue. The British, uh, former British uh, uh, Prime Minister during the Second World War said that empires of the future will not be empires of territory, but empires of the mind. So that's where we are today. We are now in an ideological warfare. And it is ideas now that are going to actually characterize this revolution, whose ideas will carry the day, whose ideas will run the world. That's where the battle is today. And so all people are strategizing to get the children and so on. So I think that is something that we all know and we need to be aware of, especially since we're dealing in education. It's good to understand the, the circumstances where we are as far as the subject matter is concerned. Now, every culture has a UTL, unique things, things that are true and things that are lies. Now, the lies are the things that actually produce the problems in, uh, in culture. I've put up there uh, what truth brings and what lies brings. And uh, when you bring up an idea, you can just see where it lies. Is it something that actually produces uh, life or produces death. Jesus said you will know the truth and it will set you free. So you can see what truth does. Now, we are supposed to encourage the truth, uh, affirm it. The natural things we're supposed to celebrate, like our languages, they're all equal and none is better than the other. Uh, but the lies are the things that actually bring problems uh, in society. Now, the church is the foundation and pillar of truth. So in other words, the church uh, comes to actually speak into ideas that are being floated around the world. And Christianity is supposed to inform and transform cultures and is supposed to challenge and defeat ideas which are based on lies. Because as you saw, lies are what is destructive in society. And so Christianity or the church or you know, um, supposed to address those 
uh, evil ideas in the marketplace of ideas and bring them down and tear them down. Uh, some of you know the verse, our weapons are not carnal, but mighty through God bring down the ideas and things that are trying to exalt themselves. That is where uh, intellectualism actually is. And unfortunately, many people who, uh, who, 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 who have the Christian uh, foundation, who should actually be there, have shied away from there. And so we've had evil ideas come and take root in society, which is very unfortunate. Now, Christianity provides the non-tangible assets that are needed in any positive revolution or reformation. Uh, because usually in anything, you need the tangible assets and the non-tangible assets. So Christianity provides the non-tangible, which actually are more important. For example, Uganda here, we have a lot of tangible assets. If you gave this country to Japanese, if you gave this country to Israelites, they would make paradise out of this country. Why? Because they have more non-tangible assets than we have as Ugandans. So the need, so Christianity helps to develop that non-tangible uh, asset. Now, mark you, we have the authority actually from the Lord to provide the non-tangible assets in society. There it is, all authorities. Therefore, go and make disciples. We also see uh, Jesus telling uh, his disciples and telling us, occupy till I, I come. So we are supposed to be the custodians of society, the church, and that's the body of Christ. It's supposed to be the custodian of society, not being the periphery, but you know, really at the center stage, providing the truth that is needed to actually occupy, uh, uh, to bring healing. So, as I conclude, how can the university uh, proceed from here? Number one, the university should become the center of biblical worldview, right? Biblical worldview, because biblical worldview is essential to transformation and to really leading society in a positive uh, direction. The verse is there, do not conform any longer, to the person of this world, but be transformed. How, now, just look at uh, secularism. I'm just putting a, a pictorial view of secularism, where there is no God and all that is there is, is nature. Now, this kind of thinking is what has dominated education. And most of our education, even in Christian, schools and Christian education is actually secular because the content actually presupposes that there's no God. And of course, the chaos we see in the world today and all that is as a result of this kind of thinking because ideas have consequences. They are not neutral. If they are based on lies, they will injure society. They will cause you know, all kinds of uh, negative things. But we also have a religious worldview, and most of us come from disciplines that actually uh, have, say, a religious worldview, which is what I'm showing now. Now, this worldview presupposes that God is only a God of the spiritual things, uh, but is not a God of the secular. Now, this worldview is also not good, and this worldview is actually part of the problem uh, part of what has caused the problem to be where it is, where we have churches, large number of churches, large number of Christian uh, populations, percentages, but little impact on the ground. That is because this kind of worldview is what is relevant, where God is only God in the church, but is not God out there in society, and that's wrong. Jesus did not have this kind of worldview. The disciples did not have this uh, worldview. The reformers during the Reformation 500 years ago did not have this kind of uh, worldview because this kind of worldview cannot transform anything. And so we need to, as religious people or other Christian, we need to get away from this and come to, to this worldview. Uh, yeah to this worldview, which is the biblical worldview, where God is the God of everything, both spiritual and secular. 
is the God of everything. He's a God of politics. He's a God of reason. He's a God of the media. He's a God of culture. He's a God of education. This is the kind of worldview that Jesus had. This is the kind of worldview that the disciples had. This is the kind of worldview that the reformers have. This is what brought the Industrial Revolution. So we need to go back to this. We need to bring to the world this kind of worldview in order for the world to really go on course, uh, on the proper um, direction with the fourth industrial revolution. The second thing that we need to do, and I only have theory, is that we need to promote uh, education that builds morals, values, and character. Not just that prepares people for a job of a particular uh, uh, vocation, vocation, but prepares them for life. Because when somebody is prepared for life, they will have all the necessary character uh, that's there. So this is what I propose. And finally, we propose that uh, the university should develop curriculum that is based on biblical worldview rather than the present humanistic and secular worldview, which is very destructive. Let's teach history from a biblical perspective. Let's teach mathematics from a biblical perspective so that people see the presence and relevance of God in all of life. I mean, God is the greatest engineer. See how he is, how he keeps the world in a balance without wobbling. I mean, the kind of science that goes there is mind boggling. Look at God as a painter. Look at the, 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 the sunset. Look at, you know, what is that? Look at the politics, you know, the way he does politics and the way he did, you know, the way we saw how he brought the greatest liberator when he liberated the children of Israel from slavery into a, into a nation. I mean, name it, endless subject. He's the greatest mathematician. I mean, his character, that's why two plus two will always be four. If God was, if the living God was Allah, maybe two plus two would be eight because that is very unpredictable. You don't know, you know, you can never, but God, the God of the Bible is, he is, his character is stable. That's why a plane can fly from London to wherever following aerodynamics and it won't change midway in, in the ocean because of God's character. And that's why mathematics is there. You know. So you can see that if everything is told from the biblical context, which I have a great world and we will not have to fear the negative impact of uh, the fourth industrial revolution because whoever is going to do it will have the right character and have the right values which will be needed to take this thing forward. So in conclusion, it is essential that the university places biblical worldview, values and principles as the foundation for her education in order to appropriately harness the potential that the fourth industrial revolution provides. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Back to you, moderator. Thank you so much, Mr. Stephen. Bef before you leave the mic, there are two questions from public. One is for IR, a threat to face religion and moral development. The second one, should the four IR be the key in public governance and management. Thank you so much. Yes, it should be because without it, because it informs everything, values inform everything. Uh, because whatever you're going to do, you base it on values. Values is the foundation and then you build your, whatever it is you're planning to do on top of it. So if the foundation is fake, you will have a fake, uh, nation, you have a fake person, you have fake programs, and so on. But if the foundation is strong, then you will actually get. So yes, it should actually be at the bottom of all that we do. Then, and and, and that's what it was during the Reformation. I mean, it was the basing of everything on values. I mean, I had the chance to visit uh, Saint Peter's in uh, in. Uh, uh, in uh, Geneva, the, and, I've, and, and that was the, the church where John Calvin preached for all 20 years. Even the seat he was uh, sitting on, which I saw. And what you what did, studied the Bible. What does the Bible talk about education? 
come on Sunday, preach about education. Then the educators grab what it is and go and run with, with it. What does the Bible say about governance? Come, preach it. Then the governors get it and run with it. What does it, the Bible say about family? And so on. So that was the basis where the Industrial Revolution came from. So once you make the, the, the teachings of the Bible and the values in the Bible at the bottom of everything, that's when we shall fly. But if we don't have that, as we are seeing now, the American nation, the American nation is now taking a different view. And a nation that, um, that works on principles that are other than Christianity or biblical, they will fail. They'll just be a question of time, they will fail. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Stephen, for that inspiring presentation. We are so humbled. Finally, we are getting there. We are not time bad. Before we go to the last item, we shall be presented by our my Lord Bishop, I would request 30 seconds each to summarize the presentation to public because they are asking me. I'll begin with Dr. Kedres, if you are still on. Dr. Kedres, it's like she has logged out. Dr. Patrick Bitature, followed by Dr. Nora and Mr. Stephen. In 30 seconds each, as we go to the last item, we shall be presided by my Lord Bishop, Dr. Fred Shedon Mesigua. Dr. Patrick Bitature. Dr. Patrick, and unmute yourself. Are you sure he's there? He's not going to business? <laughs> Dr. Patrick has gone. Dr. Nora, do you have something to summarize in 30 seconds? Thank you, Chair. I really don't have anything to summarize. I think the issues have been expounded by fellow speakers. Uh, the take home here is that we need to strategize, but also prepare for the ethical development and use issues for the 4IR. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Before my Lord Bishop concludes, I request the Chairperson Council, Bishop Stewart University, Professor Kenneth Kagame, for your summary of the summaries of the presentations. Professor Kenneth Kagame. If Professor Kenneth Kagame is not on, your technology sometimes can disappoint. I request public viewers, we go to the last item. The last item is closing remarks and benediction. Then let me take this humble opportunity to invite my Lord Bishop, Right Reverend Dr. Fred Shedon Mwesigwa, to take us on the last item, closing remarks and benediction. I thank you so much, I'm so humbled. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Anne. Uh, I want to give thanks to God for the far that we've gone. We have over short time, of course, we are supposed to have finished at one, so I imagine that's why people have run out also. But in conclusion, I want to appreciate you, the moderator. I want to appreciate uh, Professor Mauda and your team for the first of its kind. I want to believe, I want to imagine, and it has been successful in my own evaluation. And I want to thank the participants who have been attending from different locations. At least I know someone in Edinburgh, Scotland. I know someone in South Africa. I know someone in the US, 
Dr. Kathy Sigmund, I am so impressed and so encouraged. And I was also particularly encouraged to learn that among the 41% of institutions that are trying to be compliant in this field, VSU is one of those. So who are we? Uh, I think we want to thank God. I want to appreciate Dr. Mulira from National Council of Higher Education, Engineer Steven Langa, that gentleman who is doing God talk, uh, is an engineer, you can imagine. So we shouldn't be deceived when we hear people saying, me, I'm a scientist, I don't deal with God issues. The topmost engineers and scientists know God, those who are well guided. Dr. Kedres, exceptionally handy and very helpful as always. Dr. Victor Ture, businessman of his cyber, to be available, it is just amazing. And as I conclude, uh, I was touched by the, the quote, quotation from Winston Churchill from Engineer Langa, which says, empires of the future will not be empires of territories, but they will be empires of the mind. If you will see what is going on in the U.S., it's the battle of the mind, ideology. But now the question is, who informs the mind? And that's where Christian universities come in to say that the promotion of our Christian values, or even public universities, we need to be concerned about values issues, will be, should be the anchor of the four IR. Short of that, we shall continue to have challenges whereby we shall have issues like the COVID-19, which is believed actually greatly. The science that is there seems to be pointing to the fact that this was human creation. So let's have values undergirding the 4IR. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Let BSU continue to rise and rise. And academicians at BSU, please continue to promote research, innovation, so that we can improve in our in our partnership with the world out there. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for wonderful presentations from different presenters, the questions that we have attempted to answer. We pray that you continue to bless BSU, so that we shall also be blessed to take part in this fourth IR. Not easy, the commitments that are needed, financial and otherwise, but we can start somewhere. May you bless us, may you guide us. Let us also continue to have more of these conferences. We thank you, we praise you, we honor you. We pray against the forces of the evil one who want to capture the minds of your people and lead them in the wrong direction. We pray that those who have ideas and ideals and values that are for promotion of good relationship in our world will be the ones to thrive. And the forces of evil shall not thrive. We thank you, praise you, we honor you. Through Christ our Lord we pray. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you all, be upon all our presenters, all the participants, be upon all the students of BSU, be upon all the key stakeholders, be upon the VC and her team. May that blessing never leave you all and enable us to, to overcome this COVID-19. May that blessing never leave us all now and all. Amen. 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 We can live at leisure, but we are all humbled. And can you hear me? So much, my Lord Bishop. I have done that. I